And I cordially invite Anne Brasseur, president of the Friedrich Norman Stiftung for Freedom. Um, she's here and she will um, introduce us. And please, um, Anne Brasseur, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, on behalf of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, and I insist on the term freedom, I have the great pleasure to welcome you all to this 19th annual conference of the Kiev Dialogue. And I especially would like to welcome our guests from Ukraine. I know it's just two hours flight away from Berlin, but you had to take up a very, very long journey in order to come to join us in this important meeting. It's so important for all of us to know from you what is happening on the ground, and I must say I admire what you are doing uh, for your resistance and your resilience. You will tell us about the needs on the ground for the population military, politically, and also on the reform side where you uh, progressed. So it's very significant for us to have your insight. And this is more than important after the recent elections in the US of Donald Trump's. And with him back in the White House, we don't know what's going to happen with the American support. And that is to be put into question, to say the least. And unfortunately, the European summit last week in uh, Budapest didn't make any decisions. And so we don't know which path Europe is going to do. I understand that many of you are worried, so am I, so are we all, to know what this means for the future of uh, Ukraine. So let me be clear. Putin must not be allowed to get away with his blatant violation of international law. And we must do everything humanly possible to ensure that Ukraine wins this war. As a board member of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, I can tell you today, we stand firmly by your side. With its military aggression since 2014 and the full-scale invasion in February 2022, Russia has made it clear that it ignores international law and agreements. And I can tell you through my personal experience what this disregard of international law means. In 2014, I was the president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. So after the annexation of Crimea, I took a direct contact to the president of the Verkhovna Rada, as well as to the president of uh, the Duma. And I invited the president of the Duma, I went to, to uh, to Kiev, I went to uh, Moscow, and I invited the president of the Duma, Mr. Narishkin then, to come to Strasbourg in order to continue to discuss. It was not an easy discussion. And afterwards we had a press conference together. And uh, when I started the press conference, there were many, many uh, Russian reporters I said that I welcomed uh, President Narishkin and that I uh, really was glad that he accepted my invitation because we had, it, we had to keep the channels of dialogue open. But that we couldn't agree on the annexation of Crimea with, which was a violation of international law. You know what his answer was? Well, Crimea, that was a democratic process, not like the Germans did with the reunification. This is to show how firm
normally they had a disrespect for international uh, ag uh, agreements and I just wanted to tell you about my personal experience. Of course, after that, I didn't have any uh, contacts anymore with uh, the Duma. Now, Russia has revealed its colonial ambitions and desire to force its influence on the whole region by means of brutal violence and horrendous war crimes. The main findings from the last report to the General Assembly of the UN, I think that they dates back to October, on Ukraine states clearly the use of torture against civilians and prisoners of war as crime against humanity. But even if in the bleakest uh, of times, there remains a glimmer of hope. And this hope is the Ukrainian people. Despite the ruthless war that Putin is waging against Ukraine, Ukrainians have managed to further democratize their country. Ukrainian civil society and political actors have proven that they are able to continue democratic reforms on their path towards EU membership, even in times of war. And sometimes we in, in uh, the EU we are not able to make any reforms. So this underlines how, this, how big the stamina and the resilience of the Ukrainian people uh, is. The topic of today's conference, decentralized democracy and local resilience, is therefore of great importance, as they are both key factors for the integration in the EU, EU and in defeating the Russian aggressor. Local actors ensure the resilience of the country on the ground and play an enormous role in Ukraine's recovery. They are close to the citizens in those dark days of Ukrainian history and help to safeguard social cohesion in the society, which is of utmost importance. And this is a remarkable achievement, even more so if you consider the great effort and stamina that this requires. In four days, we will witness, sadly witness, the thousandth day of the full-scale invasion by Russia, or I prefer to say by Putin, in which the Ukrainian society is massively defending the aforementioned achievements, as well as its sovereignty. The Ukrainian people are bravely demonstrating their resistance and resilience. And while in some parts of the society in Western Europe, the so-called Ukrainian fatigue has emerged, it cannot be expressed often enough what these long thousand days stand for. They stand not only for the defense of Ukrainian security and sovereignty, but also for the security and sovereignty of the whole Europe. Therefore, we must never allow that this war becomes a new normality for us, a sad but unavoidable reality. Ukrainians have to fight for our values, for our freedom, and we must do our utmost to support them. With Donald Trump posed to be the next president of the US, the prospects of ongoing transatlantic support have unfortunately deteriorated. This means that it is on us, on the Europeans, to help Ukraine defend, to defend itself against the neighbor that despises freedom and democracy. It is on us to step up our humanitarian, political, and financial support to help Ukraine win this war. It is on us to empower and enable them to fend off Russian aggression. And yes, this also means allowing Ukraine to strike military targets in Russia. It is on us, ladies and gentlemen, in such dark times for Europe and especially for our Ukrainian friends, it is more important than ever to maintain the dialogue between Ukraine and its European partners. I'm therefore very honored to open the 19th annual conference of the Kiev Dialogue, and I wish us all a fruitful discussion and deep insights about the current situation of our Ukrainian partners. 
May their inputs and experiences appeal to us the empathy and the responsibility of not only everyone in this room, but also to all the citizens of a free Europe. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much. Besten Dank. Well, thank you, Anne Pasteur, for this uh, introduction from the side of the Friedrich Norman Foundation. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of Kiev Dialogue, and foremost, dear colleagues and partners from Ukraine, uh, partners from Kiev Dialogue from Ukraine coming to Berlin to talk with us, to be here with us today, coming from Kiev, from Kharkiv, from Irpin, Chuhuyev, Lutsk, Saporizhia, and Zatoko, thank you very much for making the way here to be with us here. Thank you very much. We convene here our the 19th annual conference of Kiev Dialogue. At the same time, it is the third event in a series of meetings we started early this year um, to discuss the topic of recovery and local democracy in Ukraine. In April and August this year, right before and after the Ukraine Recovery Conference, we have held two roundtable discussions where we had a deeper look into the financial architecture of the reconstruction and into the conditions for local self-government and decentralization during wartime in the country. <clears throat> it is definitely a good moment to, dis to continue this discussion today. In Ukraine, we have after almost half year of vacancy, a new minister with a new leadership team at the Ministry for Community, Territories and Infrastructure Development. We are very glad that Mikola Rubchak, the director of the Department for Local Self-Government Development, will join our discussion uh, today and inform us about the plans and strategy of the ministry. But it's also a tough time. It's a tough time not only in Germany but also in Ukraine of serious negotiations of state budget 2025. Ukraine faces enormous budget constraints and challenges. The Ukrainian communities will be confronted with a sharp decrease in tax income if the draft state budget 2025 will pass the Verkhovna Rada in the given form. The financial scope for smaller communities could shrink significantly if this draft budget would pass the Rada. Alexander Slobozhan, the director of the Association of uh, Ukrainian Cities, will inform us about these trends, about the situation more in detail in his contribution right after this discussion, uh, this opening. And finally, it is always a good, it's always good to be together in difficult times. A German government crisis and an unpredictable US administration is definitely not what Ukraine needs today. Ukraine's democracy needs security, defense, and protection. Over three years, we observed and criticized that the Western, and namely the German, military support for Ukraine was always significant, but never sufficient. Europe, and namely Germany, missed the opportunity to give Ukraine in due time what it needed to constrain the Russian aggression. Europe offers Ukraine the EU membership and expectations towards serious reforms and societal transformation in Ukraine are high. But we should be honest. Europe should itself step up like Madame Brasseur, like Anne Brasseur mentioned already. Europe should be honest. Europe should step up itself in providing anything needed and anything possible to protect Ukraine's democracy against Russian war. This is the topic of our final panel discussion today, in the afternoon, and we may expect that it will be self, a self-critical discussion. We from the community of civil society and of democracy supporters, we understand that all our efforts are built on sand if democracy is not protected by military means and by serious security guarantees 
for any of our democratic European neighborhood, neighbor countries. As a consequence of serious cuts in the budgets of German ministries, uh, Kiev Dialogue has not been able to maintain its high level of activity that we derailed and started since 2014 in the Ukrainian regions in this year. We very much regret that. Uh, we would love to be much more active with our Ukrainian partners in these difficult times. We know that Kiev Dialogue is not the only German organization which suffers uh, and which is affected by the consequences of the German fiscal policy with its so-called debt break. Several German organizations and active in Ukraine also here in the room um, uh, suffer from this political knockout. I hope that also here our politicians in the new government will take action and adapt their policy. On this background and in the name of the whole board of Kiev Dialogue, I want to express my gratitude to all those partners and foundations that enabled us to come here together to hold this conference. This is the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Liberty as our main partner this year among the German political foundations with Anne Brasseur, Anna Kravchenko and Lennart Jürgensen. It is the foundation for German-Polish cooperation with its director, Cornelius Ochmann, which enables us to include the important aspect of Polish-German-Ukraine cooperation today. It is the German platform for the reconstruction of Ukraine, represented through Andriy Gabusa and his team, and from the side of the Econom Ministry for Economic Development, Ms. Um, Ulrike Hopnishanka, that sponsored a fruitful and interesting experts exchange earlier today. And it's our true friends from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and from the Heinrich Böll Foundation, Mr. Wölbern, uh, Johannes Voswinkel and Robert Sperfeld. Here I may uh, attract your attention um, uh, to an exhibition museum of stolen art that you have the opportunity to see in this room uh, later after this conference at half past seven, this uh, exhibition will be opened. And finally, I want to express my gratitude to the Bertelsmann Foundation with Miriam Cosme. We also supported greatly this uh, conference. Unfortunately, I can say that now Miriam Cosme got ill and uh, will not hold the panel, but we have found a super expert um, 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 replacement for her. You will see later. So what is beautiful and good, all our partners give us not only money, they give us advice, consultation, and any needed support in these times. Thank you for that. And finally, I want to express my gratitude to a wonderful team of Kiev Dialogue, small but wonderful, and namely to Valeria Moiseva, Thomas Vogel, Matthias Meyer, and all the other colleagues from the European Exchange here today who enable us and help us to be here. Without you, we would not be here. Thank you very much. Now I wish us a good discussion, honest discussion, and I pass the word to Wilfried Jilge, who will moderate the first discussion. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, uh, dear colleagues. Um, um, thank you, by the way, for the invitation uh, of Kiev Dialogue. Um, uh, my name is Wilfried Jilge. I will make the moderator in the first and also in the second panel what I learned to know uh, 30 minutes ago. So uh, please excuse me <laughs> if I'm not so deeply in uh, the preparations of my. Uh, uh, well-appreciated uh, colleague Miriam Kosmil, but I try my best. Uh, I now would like to welcome uh, to our first panel. Um, it is about the challenges of local democracy uh, in Ukraine. Um, and uh, what I would like to do here is really to identify for our further panels the main questions, the main challenges, and uh, the main problems, but also the progresses uh, we can see when it comes to self-governance today. Um, I think we should elaborate on questions, uh, what are the fundamental challenges uh, in general, but also what are the challenges related especially to the war, when it comes, for example, uh, to the relationship of central government 
uh, and the communities uh, when it comes to military administrations and how they are implemented and what does that mean then for preserving the achievements we clearly have in Ukraine um, um, of self-government. Uh, what can be now even the reform steps to complete the reform uh, without changing the constitution? Because you know in the time of martial law we have limited uh, possibilities um, to complete the reform. And of course, very important, uh, what is the role of uh, civil society? We spoke already today and in the morning about capacity building, about the supportive role of local civil society uh, to empower also local self-governments and uh, to bring knowledge, expertise in to absorb also the funds which are important for the work. Um, I, and of course then we also will, uh, and we have to focus on uh, crucial questions uh, when it comes to the uh, big issue, how to implement in what way, with what mechanism, the uh, money of the Ukraine facility, which is uh, foreseen um, uh, for the communities, and also what is the state of affairs with financing self-governments in the time of war. I would like to do that uh, with my great panelists. Um, at first, I would like to introduce uh, Hanna Bonda. Uh, Hanna, it's great to have you here. She is deputy of Ukrainian parliament, chief of the subcommittee of urban development of the Committee of State Service, self-government and regional development of Verkhovna Rada. And she is a honored and very experienced architect. Uh, you were, I think, the chief architect in Kiev. Um, and uh, you are um, also dealing with an important uh, issue because urban planning, urban development in the time of war is also a challenge for local self-government because one of the core competencies of a city is to conceptualize, to, uh, to, to um, make their own environment by themselves. And I think that's a very important thing. Uh, my uh, next guest here, on the, um, uh, here in the room is uh, Professor Georg Milbrat. Um, uh, Georg Milbrat is, um, the, yes, I, <laughs> uh, is the special envoy, uh, the special J7 envoy of German federal government uh, for the administrative modernization in Ukraine. It's all about um, uh, public administration and actually decentralization. You are a special envoy for. Um, uh, what is very nice for us, um, uh, he is a great expert in what we are lacking all the time, that is money. Mr. Milbrat uh, studied math and economy and also law. Um, he was uh, head of uh, for financial issues and affairs in the city of Münster. So you are co combining uh, your experience with uh, financial policy and with um, uh, uh, self-governance. That's uh, simply great. And last but not least, and he will um, be our, he will make uh, the first input is Alexander Slobojan, the executive director he is already there. Alexander, nice to have you with us. Uh, Executive Director of the All Ukrainian Association of Local Governments, Association of Ukrainian Cities. He has a PhD in public administration with specialization on self-government. And he, has, uh, he is in that position since 2017. And he and his organization, let me say, are one of the very um, influential and very active, uh, um, let me say, advocators for decentralization reform since uh, 2014. Uh, the Association of Ukrainian Cities is one of the official representative organizations for communities and self-governance in Ukraine. In that organization, we have um, over 1,000 cities uh, represented, municipalities re represented. And uh, she plays an, uh, the organization plays an important role in the dialogue with the government, but also is a founding partner of the European Alliance of Cities and Regions for Reconstruction in Ukraine, and also, of course, a systemic partner of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe. Dear Alexander, I would like to start with you. <laughs> Hi. Um, 
Um, my question to you is, uh, at first, what are at the moment uh, the main challenges for local democracy? Uh, what are challenges uh, we already have seen before starting the war? And can you also elaborate on special challenges uh, um, uh, related to the war? And also as a guiding question, uh, what is about, uh, what are the main uh, challenges and what are the main issues when it comes to financing the communities, stable financing the communities in the time of war? Uh, Alexander, 10 minutes and you told, uh, I was told that, I were told that uh, Oksana Brodan also would like to make a comment. Uh, she's also representing your organization, but please both uh, keep or stick to 10 minutes. Thank you. Alexander. Hello, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure for me to see you all. Unfortunately, I cannot be uh, with you in presence. Thank you very much for your systematic support of Ukraine, for systematic securing democracy in Ukraine. I have a few minutes, so let me briefly touch upon the challenges, which are many. First and foremost, it is the ongoing war and the lack of people who are either on the front line or left and are now abroad. Let me focus on three critical challenges for local democracy in Ukraine. And solving those issues uh, is, well, we are capable of solving them. Uh, first and foremost, it is the uh, budget capacity of the communities. Unfortunately, the central government tries to uh, weaken it, arguing with the war. For example, withdrawing uh, the capable uh, capable communities, uh, withdrawal of the money from the capable communities and the reverse payments. It has been launched in 2022 because in wartime we can no longer use the previous formal. So in fact, after the start of the full-scale invention, the previous funding model was stopped. Let me remind you that the conference in Lugano and the following subsequencing conferences supported the other formal. We already spoke about um, the fact that uh, the uh, PIT was also withdrawn from the local budget, which is a great loss. Even though, according to the data of Ministry of Finances, those uh, funds, those withdrawn funds, um, were not uh, used for the Ukrainian army in 2023-2024, but these withdrawals are going on, and now we could reserve, preserve the unified tax for the Ukrainian community. More than 600 communities addressed the central government in Ukraine with uh, these appeals. So let me remind you that the reverse and the PIT shall remain within the territorial communities. It is important because it is with these funds that we uh, pay for electricity, for heating, for medical aid, for rehabilitation for the war veterans and for bomb shelters. And if the communities do not have those funds, they will not be able to help themselves. And we are very well aware that this reverse has been made with political aims only so that those communities are more dependent on the central government. And this is a challenge to local democracy. So we, as the Association of the Ukrainian Cities, see it as our aim to address the president of Ukraine 
our commander in chief who presented his plan of victory. Um, and we hope that he and the parliament of Ukraine will listen to us and leave us the PIT. Then uh, the the legislation of uh, the 2024, which foresees a control over municipalities and the direct intervention into the local municipalities and local businesses. To give you an example, the local administrations, local military administration can simultaneously control all decisions of the communities and at the same time control the budget and implement decisions of all communities de belonging to a certain oblast, which is a, a violation of the European Charter of Local Government. This can be a great challenge to the reform of decentralization as such. So there is a great pressure on uh, the self-government. There are 300 communities, and out of them, seven uh, oblast centers, the lack of ele elected representatives. For example, Kiev, uh, Sumy, Nitishny, Khmelnytska oblast, they have parallel military administrations and self-governments. As a result, they have constant conflicts over their responsibilities poor quality of their services for the citizens and overspending of money and constant constant uh, trials i am always at the tr in the trials because i have to be there during the uh, the trial sessions uh, at the courts uh, we thank the Council of Europe who reacted on the draft legislation 4298, which allowed us to stop this legislation from being adopted for a certain time. So let me be clear, the position of the Association of Ukrainian Cities to go back to the text of the project of the bill 42 Eight, uh, 98 of uh, as of the year 2021 and now there are 26 um, bodies of Ukrainian government who control the uh, local government. Sometimes they're even in conflict with one another. Let me give you an example. The uh, accountant chamber has now broader um, powers and now they do the same controls with the state audit service and they overspend money by controlling the local government. At the same time, the uh, state audit, the the accountant chamber members are fred from declaring their incomes. So we would like that the bill is reviewed in the interests of uh, the uh, local government. And the third challenge is the intransparent allocation uh, of uh, the European funds. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the representatives of the local governments are not included into the strategic Council of Ukraine, but they were supposed to be there. They were supposed to be asked their opinion and the location of 20% of the funds of Ukraine facility for the self uh, local self-government is not made. There is no transparent methodology. There are no consultations on that matter. And accordingly, I think that Madame Bonder will also speak about it. Uh, the urban planning is also um, like um, endangered. 
So the center government shall adopt a transparent methodology of allocating costs for the local government with priorities in certain branches according to project principles with the respect of uh, uh, damage coefficient and we may, uh, must have legislation on consultations uh, to implement to implement measures within Ukraine facility and we would like to ask you to be active and express your opinion on implementation of Ukraine facility so there are three critical global challenges so we hope for your support and I am ready to discuss further on with you thanks a lot for being active within the dialogue thank you for systematic support of local democracy and local governments Thank you, Alexander. I think you were, like every time when you give an input, uh, right to the point. And um, I would like at, uh, uh, now to follow up with Mr. Milbrat. Um, Mr. Milbrat, uh, Alexander Slobozhan spoke about uh, more control from central institutions from state administrations over uh, the self-governance. Um, it was about the problems with the financing, which is also a problem because the reforms are not completed, because uh, Ukrainian communities are still not a legal subject, which is not enrooted in the constitution. That means you can take away financial resources for the communities uh, with a, a simple majority in the parliament. So it is not constitutional. Um, my question to you is how you would like to assess um, the critical points of, of uh, Mr. Slobozhan. What is for you at the moment the whole picture a little bit? What has to be done when it comes to reforms? Which reforms which, Ukrainian, uh, which Ukraine could do now would strengthen uh, the, the self-governance. We had also here the discussion about the supervision, about the legal oversight over the uh, um, activities of communities. Um, I ask that because I think we have here very important points. On the other hand, we have also good examples. Uh, we discussed together also good examples where the uh, uh, state and the state administrations, the Oberst administrations also cooperate with the community. So what is for you now the state of affairs? Before the war, um, uh, uh, an important step uh, was uh, uh, introduced the uh, uh, new territorial organization of uh, uh, Ukraine on the local level. That was a great success and a great step forward. But it's only one step in a long, long march because some uh, problems were not touched at that moment. First of all, the other subnational uh, levels were not uh, reformed, Rayon and uh, Oblast. Rayon especially is uh, useless at the moment because they lost both of their competences because of the transfer of competences to the Romadas. So it's an empty shell at the moment. Um, uh, 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 and uh, Oblast and Rayon are still state administration. It's not self-government uh, 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 under the condition of the uh, um, European Charter of Local Self-Government. So it's only the local level which got this privilege, good, uh, good uh, step, but uh, it was not possible even before the war to change a constitution, which is still a post-Soviet constitution, to really guarantee and define local self-government. Uh, that's a problem because uh, only with the uh, constitutional um, uh, uh, definition you can defend yourself against infringements of other uh, uh, government levels, especially from above. 
and at the moment it's not really possible. Uh, that was a problem before the war, and the next step should had uh, sh uh, should have been uh, reform of the constitution, reform of the competences. If you have, don't don't know whether it's your own competences or it's delegated competences, it's very uh, difficult uh, to uh, have self-government because only self-government is uh, possible for own uh, competences. But if there is no clear definition what is own competences, it's problematic. And uh, a second uh, or a third problem existed before the war uh, that um, uh, the uh, that many or a lot of uh, control mechanism from the Soviet uh, time and uh, the time before the reform were still in place. Uh, we have heard every ministry or nearly every ministry has some sort of uh, control over um, spending and uh, um, uh, decisions of uh, local self-government. And there is no reform of this uh, according to the uh, uh, European Charter of Local Self-Government, which defines some sort of supervision. And in uh, 2018, there was a compromise between the government at that time, presidential administration, and uh, the Association of Ukrainian Cities and the other uh, uh, associations uh, to agree uh, to some sort of supervision under the uh, European Charter and on the other hand, reduce uh, uh, a lot of these old controls. This uh, uh, compromise was never uh, uh, put into a, a, a law and enacted, so it is still a problem. And uh, uh, what is under discussion now in Ukraine is that this supervision shall be on top, not instead on top of the other um, um, uh, the other uh, uh, controls. What is uh, local self-government? It's the uh, right to have your own personnel, the, your own budget, which includes that you get a minimum of money for running the business, and third, uh, that you are in uh, uh, empowered uh, for local development, especially urban planning to decide your future. And all three, uh, or, uh, two of them are in danger. One is urban planning. There's still a, a law which is not signed by the, uh, by the president, uh, which is some sort of sword of Damocles. And the second is uh, there is no guarantee of enough money. And especially now, the war comes, especially under the condition of war, there's always a cent uh, um, uh, 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 tendency, which I accept, of centralization because you have to win the war. So all means of uh, the society shall be concentrated to finance the army and win the war. But on the other hand, this uh, right of self-defense shall not misused for re, uh, an unnecessary centralization through uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, military administration. For instance, I've heard in Sumi Oblast that uh, the governor has uh, not allowed the um, mayors to meet only with, uh, 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 with the uh, uh, Okay, of uh, the governor, they can allow. Uh, they are allowed to uh, meet and discuss uh, common problems. So that is not what a military administration should do. It has nothing to do with the war. It's unuseful and uh, I think uh, problematic recentralization. And there are other tendencies as well. So I hope <coughs> that uh, after the war, this tendency will be reversed. And the, uh, the way to further self-government uh, would be enacted. Uh, and in between, you can do uh, something, especially laws which uh, do not change the constitution or against the constitution you can enact. For instance, a good uh, form of supervision 
of financing uh, uh, the Omadas for a new type or a new, uh, a new uh, uh, system of uh, fiscal uh, uh, equalization so that even uh, poor communities can survive. That could be is necessary and could be done. And the rest, which depends on um, uh, changes of the constitution, should be prepared for the day after. And nothing is done at the moment, especially uh, the associations of uh, uh, local self-government are not here uh, in, in a lot of processes, especially uh, the uh, Ukrainian, uh, uh, um, the um, Ukraine facility and the Ukraine plan. The Ukraine plan is the answer or the implementation of the U Ukraine facility. If uh, money shall be uh, given to the local level from the European institutions, then I think it's uh, necessary that the design of this transfer and the decisions, the criteria, uh, the uh, objectives shall be decided together with the uh, local uh, uh, level, that means uh, together with the association, it is not a one-way uh, uh, policy top-down uh, from, um, from the government. And that is my last uh, uh, remark. This uh, reform of local self-government is not an administrative reform to improve uh, governance. It's a very strategic reform to change a mindset in, U uh, in Ukraine and to de democratize the country from a post-Soviet or Soviet top-down organization to a bottom-up uh, organization. And I think this element is not discussed at the moment in Ukraine. Uh, you need decentralization, first of all, to be re more resilient in the war. That has, uh, has been proved, but to strengthen the country further. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, in the uh, months and, uh, before us, uh, there should be uh, some more uh, discussion in Ukraine uh, how to strengthen the, uh, local, uh, the local government. Instead, uh, there's a discussion how uh, we can uh, get more money from them. And uh, a last uh, element, uh, if money is given, there's always the possibility that it is given by political influence, not a, a money transfer concerning to uh, a clear criteria, but uh, what uh, the Ukrainians say, by hand. Uh, and I think that is not the element to improve uh, self-government in Ukraine, even in wartime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Milbrat. Um, and I would like uh, now turn to Hanna. Um, Hanna, I think you also uh, you're working also on a very important issue um, because urban development in the time of war is a special challenge uh, for material reasons but also for political reasons. Uh, when reconstruction Ukraine will begin in a, in a, in a big uh, dimension, then we will have a financial flaw of billions of euro to Ukraine. We will have big investors who will come to cities with big projects and the city has to be prepared for that. What does that mean for cult cultural heritages of, of centers of cities and all these things? Uh, we had a very problematic draft law in Ukraine on so-called city building, Misto Budovanya. What if I understood that correctly, uh, in fact, if it would have been adopted uh, meant that uh, big uh, building firms uh, can more or less decide on their own if and what they want to build. I, I'm very roughly. Can you a little bit comment on that? And can you comment on what in that sphere has to be done? You are working also in legislation on that. Mm, 
and then I also have still a follow-up question to you and to the others and to you as a parliamentarian. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the people of Germany, the German government for the support that you provide for Ukraine. And yes, of course, I would like to talk about urban planning. We have carried out one reform, another reform we haven't managed to, to uh, plan. So one reform on the urban planning we have uh, implemented, and we see that this reform is not quite effective. And the next reform that we were not able to implement, it was uh, a bill 565. It would strengthen interest of big firms and also of uh, um, central government, and it would weaken local self-government and uh, the rights of residents. And that's why I think this reform was uh, negatively perceived from many Ukrainians, so the president didn't sign it. In my view, when we talk about urban development, it's the main function of local self-government. So the state, the central government could provide you with a frame, but it can't dictate city what to do, and also municipality. As of now, we have a post-Soviet system. We have laws for all settlements, uh, like for one village in the mountains and also for Kiev. You can only do what is written in the law. If a city has own initiative, Everyone can go to court and uh, um, oppose it. And it's important that we have decentralization reform, but it's not over yet. In 2015, one part of uh, the control and powers was uh, devolved to self-government, but a huge part of housing and public houses, public buildings, is still controlled by state inspectors. So the city can't just go to the construction site and ask, what are you building there? And in my view, it's not right. We are developing a draft law. It's a ur urban planning codex. It has an aim to create a new society contract that is uh, developing during the wartime. The society contract, what it is about, the Ukrainians take on responsibility for their country. And if you take on responsibility, you need only also to be able to make decision. And we know that we had this society responsibility that uh, we had in 2011, Yanukovych signed that law about urban planning, and this law is not valid anymore in Ukraine. That's why we have created a big working group with four associations of self-government. It's architects, archaeologists, engineers, developers, constructors, geographs, economists, all are represented also CSO organizations are represented, universities, scientific institutions. And we have uh, conducted a cycle of consulta consultations and discussions in order to find a balance. And we came to conclusion that we need uh, reforms. If you are interested, you can find it on Facebook, uh, Urban Development Codex of Ukraine, you can find more information. But now, in brief, we would like to complete urban development, urban planning reform. We have to provide the communities with responsibilities, with the ability to plan their cities and towns and settlements. And we need to provide them with instruments, because today, this area is something strange because the communities have, during war, 
with the lack of professionals, they need to plan the territory of the community very detailed, and that is not realistic. That's why communities have to have realistic instruments. They should plan according to their needs, and also they should be provided with the right to plan, and uh, not someone from the central government, but the representatives of local government have to have these rights. Second point is the strengthening of residents. It's rights, but also responsibilities to take part in decision making, also to decide how their cities or towns are planned. It's crucial because we see that the people are more active, and after the war, it will further expand because many people will come back from abroad. They will have uh, new experiences, and people will want to take part. And third point is ecological agenda. We have to include it in our bill some parts of Green Deal and the directions that will allow us to build sustainable cities. When we talk about uh, the EU, I can't say that the EU has a law about uh, urban planning, but we have many best practices. We were listening to 11 experts from all over the world, and we will integrate their knowledge. Maybe you have some questions and it correctly um, your the, the codification of urban planning um, is also important by the way because it is also one one uh, issue we have here uh, to reduce corruption I think because the more the more competent the process is being loaded, the transparency is guaranteed. That is also something which is preventing intransparent mechanisms on the local level. Or do, do, don't I understand it correctly? Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. We will implement transparent procedures. And today or yesterday, Volodymyr Zelensky have signed a law 1061 about implementation of the law about administrative procedures and that changes the approach of uh, the government officials about public services. And we will move in this direction also to implement more digitalization. So because we can't digitalize cows, we need a little bit different approach. We need transparent uh, digital instruments. I would also like to add, when we began to work in our working group, we had this feeling that people who is not happy with the situation or who is lacking on trust to the government, these are the people from the local self-government and also some experts. But last week, the Association of Developers are also not happy about what is happening in the legislation. So, And their main point was that we need to minimize investment risk risks. They were saying that decentralization is not working. So. We have many sides who criticize the situation. That's why we will do everything in order to create this concept, urban planning concept. We will discuss about this. All our events are public um, events, and we have bottom-up policy. So I, Hanna Bondar, me, uh, I am not saying to telling people what they have to write. It's the other way around. Uh, I now look, would like to uh, ask you a final question because, and by the way, we will not have here a plenary discussion. We take the plenary discussion of panel one. 
to the plenary discussion of panel two together, so you can ask your questions later. Um, uh, Alexander, are you with us? Yes, okay. Um, I have a question to you. Um, what do you expect, I mean, against to the background what you said, uh, when it comes to interventions from the central uh, institutions into self-governance, when it comes to new degrees of the president of Ukraine to introduce military administrations in oblasts which are far from the front without any criteria and clearness about uh, the competencies which are given to these military administrations. Um, what do you expect from what, who, who are the partners of Ukraine and in what context uh, these problems should be um, put on the agenda? So what do you expect from European Union, from Germany? Uh, where do you see processes in the integration process where these problems should be um, presented? Thank you very much for the question. I would like to note that our European partners before the war and now during the war, they are helping us. They are helping the local self-government and this reform, the first step of decentralization, we all agree it was successful and it wouldn't have been possible without this systemic help from our European partners. That's the first, my first message. The second one is, what do we expect? And this is already noted in European roadmaps. We want that our central government is abiding by all these points. And we have a document from the European Commission about the accession process. And there are some indicators. And one of them is financial capacity of the local self-government. Municipalities should be able to defend themselves in court, should have this also these capabilities by law. And it's stated that 64% of this PIT a military person income tax should be at the communal level. And the second document of the European Commission is stating that we should amend our legislation and to put in place strict criteria of implementation and of the for these military administrations to strictly divide the competences between these military administrations and the state governmental bodies or local governmental bodies to avoid the collapse of local self-government. And we also expect that the Ukrainian side will carry on after the European analysis, the analysis from the European side, all the indicators which are stated in the Ukraine facility, because there are some uh, guidelines regarding transparent reforms and the transparent use of financing of uh, the uh, money that is coming from the European Union. And we hope that as soon as we can do it in Ukraine, maybe if the martial law, when it's finally abolished, that we will finalize the process and also our decentralization reform, also with our amendments to the constitutions, that this reform will be successfully wrapped up in every region where, we, where it would be possible. And our European partners are helping us, already have helped us quite a lot to prepare concept for the restorations of uh, restoration of local self-government, and it's now being discussed in our 
discussed by our politicians, by our high-level politicians as well, and we will adopt a new, renewed concept of local self-government with our European partners, with the Association of Ukrainian Cities. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank Mr. Milbrat for all his help with this concept of local self-government, the implementing and Thank you so much. I thank you, Alexander, and I think it's also a task for us. Eine letzte Frage stellen. Ähm, wo sehen Sie denn, wo sehen Sie denn die Möglichkeiten? B bitte. Ach yes. Uh, uh, excuse me. Ukrainian English. Okay. Uh, German. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Milbrat, where do you see the entry points and where do you see the right actors and processes to bring in recommendations to, to stop risks which can lead to a regress in the overall successful uh, uh, self-governance reform? Well, uh, <coughs> and I say that, I say that also against to the background of president-elected Mr. Trump mm. and eventual impact on the J7 rounds, which were very important for key reforms. We already have tendencies that the Americans maybe are more interested in infrastructure and big projects than in self-governance processes uh, already in the last time. So how do you think what, what should be done? Uh, well, first of all, it's up to the Europeans uh, to help Ukraine, and we have uh, the way to accession. And that means it's in the interest of Ukraine to adapt to European rules. Now, to uh, uh, make this accession possible. In Europe, you have not only friends, the, uh, the, uh, the Ukrainians, there are a lot who are against accession of, uh, um, of Ukraine. And they were looking very carefully whether Ukraine will fulfill the criteria. And so this process of the Ukraine facility is some sort of test for this enlargement process. You have to see in, in the enlargement process, not, we are not fighting the war, and then we are reforming local self-government, and then uh, uh, um, uh, entering the EU. No, it's a process, a common process, and therefore, uh, from the European side, that is the European Commission, and in the past it was the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the European Par Parliament is now doing uh, or electing or uh, uh, accepting uh, the new commissioners, so they have other things to do. Uh, but uh, uh, in December this will be finished and then the European Parliament will look very carefully uh, what, uh, how its wish, this was this 20% uh, this, uh, uh, for uh, subnational governments, will be fulfilled by the Ukrainians. And if they uh, see that in the end the money goes uh, 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 to the central government and will be spent without uh, a real consultation of the local level, then they will say, well, uh, that was not our intention uh, to, uh, to put this element into to the Ukrainian facility and they will uh, ask and demand from the European Commission uh, to uh, uh, implement this in the, uh, European pl uh, the Ukraine plan as well. And therefore, I think, first of all, the uh, Europeans and the EU, EU Commission and European Parliament must say and on the, one, on, the, on the one hand help, and the other uh, uh, hand say the European what they wish and what are the conditions for accession. Um, and uh, uh, I think then uh, there will be a way, an interaction between the Commission, European Parliament, U uh, European national governments, and the, U uh, the uh, 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 Ukrainian government uh, to find a way for if Ukraine, and I think they, they have to and they will, accept these criteria. That means su uh, subsidiarity is one of the main principles of the European Union. That uh, polit uh, uh, public uh, uh, duties or public um, uh, policies should be 
uh, made on the lowest level possible and not the other way around. So subsidiarity is, is, a, is the, one of the main principles. And I have the, uh, the impression at the, uh, uh, at the moment that this thought uh, uh, is not uh, uh, known in, uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine politics, uh, subsidiarity. Uh, and then we come to the uh, other elements uh, which I have uh, uh, defined before. If you have to want uh, uh, a local self-government and you have to define what is local self-government, what are the competences, what are the fields where they can uh, do the, uh, their job, and second, money, and third, legal protection. Yep. So that is necessary, and is, that is uh, in all European countries. And if, uh, um, uh, because of uh, the regional policy, which is very, which is very uh, important uh, in, in Europe, you will, so you want to reform the oblast level because the oblast for the European uh, regional policy are uh, very important. Then look to, uh, to your neighbor, Poland, yeah. or uh, to France, which have a, a similar political structure, a very central uh, political structure with uh, some sort of region, uh, or uh, uh, the region, uh, region in, 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 uh, in, uh, in France. So, there are not of elements uh, to uh, uh, to uh, adapt uh, to this European um, uh, to this European uh, standard, but I have the impression at the moment that from the Ukrainian side, maybe from the U uh, European side as well. But let's uh, first let's uh, win the war; uh, the rest comes later. I think it's necessary to do both jobs: to win the war, to help Ukraine more than before because of Trump. And on the other hand, say to the Ukrainians, uh, use the time in the war and after the war for preparing the accession and in the end, to, uh, the guarantee of your status. Thank you so much. That was, I think, quite clear. <laughs> Hannah, Hannah, the last, you have the last point here, the last comment. Um, and. I mean, I would like you. I would like to ask you about the role of the Parliament, and and I have the impression a little bit similar to the European Commission, because the European Commission also did not so much pay attention, I think, to as it needed to the local governance, and also in the Parliament, when I asked deputies, for example, uh, about the legal subject of communities, uh, they see it more a danger rather than a chance. Um, and it is also that I see not so many politicians who are really committed, committed to the core principles of self-government, uh, not because they are against or something like that. As simple, it is difficult to find a, a, a deputy specialized on the understanding what that is, multi-level governance, because I think parliament is very important and parliament in Ukraine, as Ina Pitluska said today, and that was so important, is working during the war. Uh, it is a platform where you can make changes. So um, can you explain a little bit what is here the climate in the parliament when it comes to these, com to complete the self-governance reform and to really make a community uh, as a legal subject on equal terms. Chesno? <laughs> Should I be honest? Uh, yes, I will try to explain. In our committee, in my opinion, we have a powerful community dealing with the local self-governance because it's what our committee is doing, and all the uh, all the members of parliament who were interested, they are members of this committee, and on local self-governance, and to raise the awareness in the parliament in the Verkhovna Rada, what is the local self-government? It would be important that the that our local self governance is, well, we have uh, really lots of uh, deputies who never worked in the local self-government, who were never part of it, especially in the Slova Narodu uh, party, so they don't have this vision, and it's really 
nice that our committee is conducting regular meetings with our municipalities uh, twice. Uh, every fortnight we go to the local bodies, we go to the regions, we are presenting our uh, dra draft laws and the people are listening very carefully and uh, we can adjust our work and our legislative work uh, due to this, uh, these meetings with the local self-government uh, authorities and it's also so important uh, to communicate. But of course, I would also, uh, I would also like to tell our uh, people working in the local self-government, go to the parliament, run for parliament. It would be very important. Uh, I think it's also about the role of civil society. Um, I only would like to mention what I was told by our colleague Maria Lukyanova, who is working in, in, East, in Western Ukraine, that, for example, the people from the oblast level in that Oblast are very uh, intensively work, working with the communities every time. They traveling in the oblast and they try to cooperate with the community. So what I want to say, and also what you said today, uh, our colleague from Churuyev uh, in Kharkiv Oblast. So uh, as a head of military administration, you are engaged in projects. So I think what is also be very, what is also very important that we and that could be also a role of our network here to show up and bring to the public in Ukraine and here the good models, the pilot models which are already functioning that, that we can, because we have that, I mean we have a complex picture and uh, that, that, tho that those people who are still on the way to learn that, uh, to go for another mindset, that they can be engaged and provoked to do the same uh, in their field. So, thank you very much. We now, I think, will have only a few minutes for restructuring here the four, and um, yes, I will be happy to see you again in a few minutes. Okay, okay uh, dear colleagues, uh, welcome to our uh, second uh, panel. Uh, needs and capacities of local structures, resilience, and self-governance. Uh, again, uh, normally here should uh, here should be present Mrs. Mi um, Miriam Kosmil, but uh, she she got uh, ill, and I will try to replace her, uh, relying also on her preparations. But I try a little bit also to improvise uh, because, um, of course, it's, it's, it's difficult uh, what she had in mind, something. Um, but let us a little bit go deeper uh, into fields we already touched in the first panel. We spoke already much about resilience. Um, I would like to remind the 24 uh, U uh, Ukraine report of the European Commission multi-level governance remained crucial to Ukraine's resilience and recovery. So we will discuss here why and how local governance structures resilient, how they can be strengthened in their resilience, how self-governance um, can be important for community development, but also for local and even regional economy. Um, do self-governances also stand for good governance, for anti-corruption fight and reducing bureaucracy? And as we already said, before, of course, European integration is the main topic then with Cornelius Ochmann's European panel, I would say, but again, let's remember the respect for principles in the European Charta of Local Government, which relatively clearly says how self-governance should be enrooted in the legislation of a member country, and please Remember, Ukraine already ratified 
uh, the Carta in 1996, in the year of the Ukrainian constitution. Um, we also, I think, shall discuss the relationships between central organs and the self-governance, and maybe our colleague from the ministry can tell us what they maybe have prepared for that relationship. And it's also about concrete issues which are of crucial importance during that winter, that is energy efficiency, that is how communities to empower to be a driver of decentralization of energy supply, um, and thus become even more a pillar of resilience. I would like to introduce our great panel. Oh, we are really a little bit late. Um, at first, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Michalina Skorik. Uh, she is an elected deputy of the local parliament of Irpin City Council. So, in one of these uh, cities who are heavily suffered from the first time of Russian invasion. She also has been an advisor to the head of Butcher City Council and then become a deputy um, head of Butcher City Council since May 2020. Um, she has great knowledge on economy, investments, digitalization, media, public sector, um, and I think maybe like no one here, she represents also um, the tragedies of that war. Uh, if I can say that, your first husband has been killed by a Russian sniper in 2014. 2014. The second has been mobilized for Ukraine armed forces uh, when the full-scale invasion started. And that reminds us again that that war started in 2014 and not later. Um, and thank you for being with us because I think you, you have that very important, you have that theoretical uh, basis and you have that practice, pra experience of practice, uh, how, how to strengthen capacities of communities. Uh, Clara Volentiero is a regional director of the Black Sea Trust of the German Marshall Fund, uh, on my right. Uh, she's a government expert, um, uh, focusing, I can say, on uh, regional and community planning. Um, you are also consulting international organizations like the World Bank, also European Union, I think. Um, in academics, you are an associate professor um, of political economy at Bucharest University. You have a very good experience uh, how all these processes look like in Romania, and maybe you can also give us some experience from that. Um, now I want to uh, uh, um, welcome uh, our uh, partners uh, sitting online, um, I think in Kiev or maybe not in Kiev uh, at first, uh, Sviatoslav Pavlyuk, Sviatoslav, it's nice uh, to have you, to see you again after a long time. Uh, because I, I look there because uh, the screening is not functioning here. Um, uh, uh, Sviatoslav Pavlyuk is executive director of the Association of Energy Efficient Cities of Ukraine, an uh, organization to enhance uh, the capacities of municipalities regarding energy programs supporting municipalities in their commitments to modernizing municipal infrastructure and striving for carbon neutrality. Um, he, I mean, I cannot read out everything here because it's so much and so broad. Uh, he was a team leader for the convenient of Mayors East project in 2012 to 15 overseeing activities of more th of around 200 municipalities across 11 countries, so he has also international experience in the self-governance sphere. Um, and he's, of course, uh, an, an, uh, also an advisor uh, who, called in, uh, who advises ministries on national energy, on uh, local energy programs and projects, um, 
district heating, energy efficiency, water supply, very important now, wastewater management, everything what is needed uh, to conceptualize the resilience in the sphere of critical infrastructure. And I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Mikola Robchak. Thank you that you, uh, that, you join, that you joined us. He is a director of the Department for Local Self-Governance Development Territorial Organization of Power and Administrative Territorial Structure at the Ukraine's Ministry for Communities, Territories and Infrastructure Development. In his capacity, he focuses on enhancing uh, the capacities of local governances, uh, optimizing administrative divisions to improve governance and service delivery. I hope that is correct. Uh, I, I, okay, but if you can also uh, say some words about you. Um, and he worked previously also uh, with amalgamating communities, um, also uh, focusing on uh, enhancing capabilities, effectiveness of the services. So he is also someone who is not only working as a desk officer, but has also practical experience. I'm very happy that you're with us. Thank you so much. Um, I would like uh, to begin. Uh, and I would, would like to suggest we have um, a few questions and you can very flexibly outline on that questions, take it as a guiding question, um, and uh, then we have maybe a little bit more time for plenary discussion uh, in order to take also the questions we already have from the first panel. Uh, Michaelina, um, um, when it comes to your work on the ground, um, what can you say in, in a time of lack of capacities actually now? And you're working very deeply with reconstruction in the region I, uh, around Kiev. Uh, what capacities have proven to be essential and useful and what mechanisms have proven to effectively uh, enhance the capacities of your local governance part partners. Uh, maybe you can give us uh, some examples. And I would be also interested, because we have that uh, topic on relationships between central powers and um, the, re the local, the local self-governance. Um, you are, with your activities, with your, with your advisory activity, you are also a little bit in between, and maybe you can also tell us when and how that relationship functions well. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I uh, try to answer a bit broader, because as you understood uh, this um, war and all what connected uh, with my country is very personal for me because when my husband uh, decided to join uh, Armed Forces of Ukraine as volunteer officer, he said in uh, 2014 uh, that uh, I have to go to fight for Donbass because one day they would come back uh, to Europe. And in 2022, And in 2022, when we saw Russian helicopters above uh, Antonov Cargo Airport in Hostomol, which is very close to Bucha and Derpin, where I used to work as an advisor on digitalization and local development and strategic planning and economy development, nothing connected to the war and to the um, air attack uh, protection strategies, uh, I understood that we didn't do enough in time. And we know that if we, we don't do enough to fight with evil, the evil is scaling. And that's the main conclusion is that we have to scale, in, to scale our uh, best practices better than the evil is growing. And that's, and that's our common task to um, stop the evil altogether. Um, and now I go down to the local level. 
uh, because uh, experience of Kyiv region is very important. We have this um, practice of two years of re real recovery, and that's what we could share, and that's what we could learn from. Because um, Bucha, Irpin, Hostomel, they were completely evacuated in 2022. No people, no kids, no um, local governance in occupied from others in occupied community. And uh, Russians even killed the mayor of Hostomel. And that's why in Hostomel we have unique situation where we have, we have a military administration appointed by the president and no self-governance because the local deputies didn't have capacity to meet together to, to appoint a new mayor according to Ukrainian law. And we could compare how the community without the mayor, with military and administration, deal with uh, reconstruction, comparing with uh, um, cities like Bucha and Derpin, where we have strong self-governance. Uh, and we could uh, for sure say that decentralization, that's really the best reform we did uh, during the last two, 10 years, and that decentralization helped local councils and mayors uh, fight with uh, the enemy and also uh, lead the reconstruction process. And where w in those territories, when we have very strong communities, um, uh, strong civil society and volunteers help, who are helping a local government, uh, they deal with the threat better than uh, in other places in Ukraine. Uh, so, um, if we talk about the capacity, of course, the threat is there in Ukraine and the main uh, um, need we have that security and uh, local government is uh, uh, taking uh, their responsibility for that because we created like self uh, um, uh, territorial defense forces and that's how we help armed forces of Ukraine during the uh, last two years. Um, and the second task for the communities uh, um, is uh, organize rebuilding process, uh, rebuild uh, houses, and uh, that's where um, the key how to bring uh, Ukrainians, how to bring uh, people back to their homes. Because if people believe that their families will be protected enough in uh, their uh, towns and cities, um, families are coming back. They feel better in Ukraine than even in Germany uh, because uh, of uh, the language, because of the families, because of the links. Um, we see that families are coming back if they have places for living and that's very important uh, reason. And then the next schools and kindergartens, they have to be operated, they have to uh, reconstruct bomb shelters, um, they have to organize enough spaces in bomb shelters, because very often we still have like online uh, education instead of offline, uh, because of the reason of security, um, we don't have enough spaces in bomb shelters to organize a proper ed educational process. So uh, we have places for sitting, for hiding uh, children from the air attacks, but not for the edu organizing education, and that's what, what, what we try to improve in Irpin, in Bucha, and other communities. So um, speaking about the children, we have unfortunately sad sample, a small village, Moshun, very close to Kiev, very destroyed, 90% uh, of the houses were destroyed. They have private houses and we have exact figures that from 160 children, 40 uh, didn't come back to the village because they don't have place for living, they don't have uh, school, their school was destroyed. That's the result uh, of two years of reconstruction in Hostomel community where the mayor, as I mentioned, was killed in 2022. So we, that's, that's where we need outside help to deal with uh, such a problems because if we feel lack of capacity of local uh, governance, we need outside uh, uh, supervision and support. Um, so, uh, Kyiv region uh, is very good sample how reconstruction could be successful or which mistakes uh, we could see during this process. 
And of course, um, we have this, very often we hear this question about the corruption. We have money, we could give it to the communities, but because of local corruption, we think that better and uh, there we could hear different options. From our um, experience, we see that if money goes locally, we see less uh, corruption and the process could be organized very uh, transparent and very uh, uh, clear if uh, this money um, comes with uh, project managers who could organize uh, the process properly. Because usually we, as a local council, pay for the um, documentation for the projects and expertise, and then uh, project teams and uh, or uh, the donors are organizing the reconstruction itself. Um, so, um, if money goes, uh, comes with uh, good uh, and clever management, it works very well and the reconstruction is uh, uh, quite fast uh, and we see those samples in our region. Um, and um, about, uh, if we speak about uh, like local level and central level, uh, we see that this cooperation uh, is uh, very good in Kiev region, but uh, it might be because, uh, you know, the uh, former leaders of Kiev region now are in, uh, minister, in ministry, uh, deputy ministers are in Kiev regional administration, so they know very well um, um, problems of our communities, and that's why I think that this process uh, is good for us and uh, couldn't be like the ideal sample for Chernigov region or Kharkiv region where this connection is not so strong. Um, but what I want uh, to underline that um, in the process of recovery is very important horizontal links. Let me tell one story, um, Bucha, before full-scale invasion, had very good uh, uh, twinning relations with Tushin and Pshina in Poland. And um, because of that, um, Poles helped us first days, but they um, understood that they don't have enough resources to support Bucha a uh, long time, and they linked Bucha to Bergisch Gladbach. They are German partner, uh, um, Bergisch Gladbach is a um, um, like suburb uh, community close to um, Hamburg, no, um, um, uh, Cologne, sorry, to Cologne. Uh, and uh, they are very similar to, they are very similar to what Bucha was before full-scale invasion and links were like, and, and uh, Bergisch Gladbach helped Bucha uh, with two tracks full of uh, food and uh, humanitarian stuff in uh, April 2022. And then we developed those links and two mayors meet together and then deputy mayors meet together and then educational department and fire workers and other people um, meet to, to know each other. And those links now work very well because school number five negotiate with school in Bergisch Gladbach. Uh, mayors are negotiating, deputy mayors are negotiating. And uh, you can't do it by projects, but you could do it by very well communication uh, at horizontal level. And I believe that those links who helped us to become stronger in 2022 will work in 2025 as well. So we need to develop those uh, horizontal negotiation and scale it, and it will help Ukrainians to survive in uh, those hard uh, um, uh, circumstances we are now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like name uh, s some points I think important that uh, if money comes to the local level, it is very often because maybe of the ownership of those who get the money, it is more transparent, the processes are more so. It's an important question because 
we have that argument that it, the opposite is true also. Um, uh, you spoke about horizontal relationships. I think we should maybe later also touch the horizontal relationships and the perspectives between the Ukrainian communities because we have also limits because of the martial law here, which I cannot really understand. Um, um, and thank you also uh, so much bringing us back to very concrete preconditions which are everything for everything that is, for example, bombing shelters. And I would like to remind that the URC conference 2024 brought here to Germany the great architects from Kharkiv and other regions, uh, so-called um, rebuilding labs. Yeah, uh, I think we should not underestimate that very concrete thing, that if people should stay in Chernihiv, for example, and I have been to Chernihiv uh, recently, uh, and that's great, yes, that they can stay there. The, the, the city is working near the front, but it's only because it, it can remain only if they really have the facilities to do that. And I think here we, we, we need to think about that. If we want to Ukrainians stay where they can stay, it's important. Now I would come to Mikola. Uh, Mikola, my question to you from the perspective of national government, um, how how you see the relations to the local local government uh, government and how do you support how do you support these relations and what are do you what are you doing uh, for strengthening the capacities of the local governance in the sense what mr milbrat said using the principle of subsidiarity so to give them help for their own help uh, can you maybe a little bit on your strategic approaches and uh, what, yeah, thank you. Hello, colleagues, friends, and hello, members from all countries. The connections to communities in general, we have established in 2014, in the beginning of the war, because the concept of reform, self-government reform that was established in 2014, it was developed uh, through inclusive process and it included all stakeholders of this process. This working group included 50 people, scientists, CSO, different institutions, local self-government from all three levels, and also, of course, the central government. At that time, we established a communication, good communication, of course. Not everyone liked this, uh, um, I would say, in inverted commas, uh, that we wanted to discuss with uh, communities, because some communities um, who were in better conditions, maybe, maybe better geographical conditions, uh, they didn't like the intrusion of the central government. For other communities, the central government uh, uh, was welcome because they provided essential financial support. But this financial support had to go through different level. After fiscal decentralization in 2015, when we changed the allocation also uh, changed the uh, PIT rate, rate for regions, and the next changes led to communication between communities, municipalities, and also these changes uh, led to communication between central government and communities. And this communication is. Uh, um, going further and developing further, and it's quite successful. We have uh, cooperation with all types of uh, 
governments, uh, with uh, territorial um, communities, municipalities, uh, and uh, the communication and cooperation works. So it's important to coordinate. It's important to communicate effectively, efficiently. And I can't say that we didn't hear someone on the central government level. Maybe it was communicated like that. Euro the European Union also supported this uh, reform and the US. The European Council concluded that in 2017, this reform was uh, called as uh, the most successful reform in Ukraine because 45, 50 percent of uh, heads of communities uh, were for the carrying out of this reform. And it was important because we have seen how effective this reform is. And uh, I want to express my respect for Mikhailina for also different uh, other communities that took on the first um, atrocities and uh, of the war. And I have a respect for these communities for the recovery and also for the development uh, of this feeling that they can manage their communities. That led to, that enabled them to defend themselves and also to survive after the full-scale invasion. As of today, the Ministry of Communities and other stakeholders continue to develop these uh, points because we still have challenges because uh, we have we have to implement uh, to carry out different reforms but it's also about the ability of municipality to perform their functions. So we have communication, we have meetings, we proceed with our work on the accountability and also we see who is best for performing some functions in order to, to establish decent conditions for living for citizens. So we want to create um, similar condition for everyone. Of course, it's difficult because, as I said in the beginning, not all communities have this um, positive geographical location and uh, after the full-scale invasion there are more challenges coming so when the municipality is uh, near front we have also to count that in now we work on the different strategies in and these processes according with our legislation, with our Ukrainian legislation, municipalities also take part and their associations. So that's why we have communication with uh, municipalities. My mobile phone um, have many people and many people call me from very interesting places. So we have a direct communication. We are not hiding somewhere. When the need is there, we communicating and we are open, we are listening, we listened, we heard and we considered the different suggestions from locations and we um, 
answered to the problems and now we continue our work of course it's uh, not easy because uh, we have to amend uh, around 200 laws so basic laws and the functions in the in the in the legislation is not precise so we have to work on them that's why we have to proceed with our work on this route on this way we have challenges we have needs on the central level and also on the level of municipalities as far as I am informed and the main challenges first of all it's about uh, experience exchange also in the context of European integration in the process of uh, um, accession of Ukraine and we know that uh, some countries were recovering uh, with their own resources but also with the uh, aid international aid but it's important to have uh, personnel to have uh, specialists people have to know how to include financial resources but also specialists how to work with projects how to implement and develop projects therefore as of today we try to work in this difficult conditions with all limitations due to martial law uh, under shelling under constant shelling to carry out the reform that has started in 2014 or in 20 a in 2008 informally thank you for that oversight or um, and for your um, um, insights how you approach uh, to um, local communities and how you approach to that relationship Clara um, I would ask you against to the background what we've heard um, how can local governance become a factor for community develop development um, uh, for economy uh, um, what has to be done we already heard from Mikola about uh, the strategy for regional development um, we know that Ukraine is a quite uh, is, is a is a country with many differences and and you should take an into account take into account also the interests and the special needs of, of different uh, local and regional uh, territories. So uh, what is here important? Um, and I also have an, another question uh, when it comes to investments. Um, I remember when the state already in 2023 started the reconstruction of housing in Kiev Oblast, started offering to give money for the local levels, uh, for, for the business, for the business. Uh, they uh, were a little bit um, disappointed that the business was not willing to take that money, saying that the bureaucracy around that uh, will bring more harm than use. And so for me, it's also here, so what are the conditions in the time we have in Ukraine to keep local economy, to, to make uh, the local communities a driver for development? Thank you. I mean, this is a question for um, all of us, not just for Ukraine. Yeah. How do we strike the right balance between central government and local governments? The balance of power has been a centuries-old question across Europe. Um, but I think 
Ukraine is actually a very good example of where the right balance should be struck. And it's a very good example after the decentralization uh, reform of 2015. That's when I think Ukraine has managed to strike the right balance and has proven to the world that this idea that corruption at local level or, or, or low capacity at, at local level is actually not linked at all to decentralization, but the opposite. It's linked to what we call budgetary clientelism, when local governments and mayor and local decision makers have to always go to the central government to ask for resources. So they become dependent on a political decision-making process that's not focused on the beneficiary, on the citizens. Um, and I think this is a very important aspect to remember when we all talk about the accountability mechanisms of the recovery uh, assistance packages, because it is not the challenge of accountability at local level that we should be mindful of, but the long chains of decision-making process that are not always transparent, they're ambiguous, and we've heard in the first panel how there is this overlap, increasing overlap, not always intentional, but increasing overlap within the decision-making cycles on the vertical and horizontal levels. So I think ambiguity and lack of transparency are major uh, concerns, not ownership at local level. And it's fantastic to talk about consultation and dialogue. It's already a step forward from, from many other contexts, not just the war read in Ukraine, but also peaceful societies where sometimes decision makers at central level don't always engage with multiple stakeholders. And that's always a mistake because always in times of crisis, it is local communities that step up and know what's best for them. If we look at the data, we had a recent study on, on Ukrainian communities, and it's a follow-up study to several studies we've done at GMF on local resilience and mutual engagement since the pandemics. And we've looked at Poland, we've looked at Romania, we've looked at Hungary, and now we're looking at, at Ukraine in times of crisis. And what we find is that most of the time, local communities, just like the national authorities, are ill-prepared for a crisis. That's the truth. And I think it's not necessarily because of what we do, but because we always hope for the best. And maybe that's one of the resilience aspect of us as human beings, hoping for the best. But we also need to, to be mindful of how to prepare for the worst. And I think looking back at all of the crises that we're facing collectively in Eastern Europe, preparing for the worst is actually acknowledging that the greatest agility we find in a crisis context, we find it at local level. And again, this is the data that we have on a recent cross-regional um, uh, data collection process in Ukraine in 20 uh, localities, large and small across the country. And what we find through different stakeholder measures is that civic actors and local governments have been the most agile <coughs> stakeholders in Ukraine, better um, equipped to, to adapt to the circumstances of a crisis, not always having the best resources, not always having the best financial capacity, but always being closest to the needs on the ground. And I think this is very important. This is something we all feel instinctively, but the, the data also supports. Now, coming back to how do we move forward from dialogue and cooperation? I'm looking at the managerial tool, which is called the Rachi Matrix, and probably many of you who haven't worked in the consultancy business don't know what it stands for. It stands for responsibility, accountability, consult parties that are responsible, parties that are accountable, parties that are consulted, and parties that are informed. And within this matrix, unfortunately, the best case scenario for many of the local stakeholders in Ukraine is to be consulted or informed. But how many of them are actually accountable and responsible for the budgets that they should be implementing, implementing, for the projects that they should be implementing in the benefit of their local communities? So talking about the framework architecture of how, you know, how Ukraine as a part of the European Union should look like, yes, there are great examples in Poland. There are great examples also in Romania where local governments and, of course, the federal <laughs> state of Germany, where local governments and regional authorities are not just consulted but accountable and responsible for the well-being of their community. 
And that truly means, and I think it was mentioned in the previous panel, that truly means a functional social contract. Because at the end of the day, and this is again part of the data that we've collected, and there are briefs at the entry if you're interested, it's also a question of how interested and invested local stakeholders are. And if we look again at different stakeholders across Ukraine, the most interested and invested in local affairs are always civic society actors and local governments, local media. And it's by nature of proximity. It's by nature of belonging. That's where they live and work. That's where their kids go to school. So it's always the greatest investment there. Now, in terms of coming back a little bit to what we can do as an international community, let's say, as an international gathering, I represent an international organization, and I think what we need to be mindful of when we do, for example, international assistance and cooperation with counterparts from, from Ukraine and elsewhere across uh, the Black Sea region, in my case, <clears throat> what we need to be mindful is that we actually engage also with people who want to work for these local community affairs and not draw them into in these international priorities that we are always concerned about where their focus should always be towards their communities and not towards the transatlantic dialogue process. There are parties that should be engaged to international diplomacy and parties that should remain focused on local community affairs and NGOs and civil society agents should be empowered to cater to local needs. And that's why we generally tell our partners across the Black Sea region that it's not going to be just Chisinau or Kiev or Tbilisi who are going to join the European Union, but it's the whole of the country, the whole of the people, all of the uh, local um, communities that will be part of this shared space space that should promote democracy and economic prosperity. And coming back to your very important question, whether there is a connection between self-government and good governance. I've just touched upon the idea that having a proper social contract between local decision makers and their citizens is the right way to strike a balance. So 40% PIT at local level obviously empowers that relationship where I can, I can be accountable to provide to you what you need. Because I have, if I am local decision maker, I have the means to do so. And if I don't do it, then I have no one else to hide um, after. I am the only one responsible to provide those public services that were already mentioned, whether it is health, education, waste management, you name it. These are the type of things that local governments should take care of. But of course, there's always a place for central government. And talking about a comparison, let's imagine a, an apartment building, right? There's a space for ownership within each of our communities, and then there's a shared space for national security, national priorities, strategic dialogue, and so on and so forth. So I think it's always uh, important Sorry. important to understand that the cooperation should exist. And my final point, where does the economic prosperity come into place? Where, well, it's what we've looked at across Central and Eastern Europe, it's local development alliances, where people feel they are belong of their shared future, of their local community, they join forces. And that's when we see private sector, public sector, academia, civil society actors, media coming together and designing their own future, masters of their own fate. And that's what we've seen working from Gdansk to Debrecen to Cluj to all the secondary cities that do not have the benefits of the capital city, do not have the automatic traction of development. They rely on local alliances of development. And that's why they have to be empowered to function together, to be in it together. And my, my very final point is that talking from Berlin, we need to acknowledge that there is a lot of diplomatic complacency. Moving forward at a very fast pace with the reforms and the recovery and the elections across the transatlantic space and the uncertainties, everyone is trying to do as much as they can as fast as they can. And as a professor of international diplomacy, I acknowledge how much easier and swifter it is to have a single counterpart than to engage in what is clearly the proper way to go, a multi-layered 
diplomatic engagement. And coming back to 1988, Robert Putnam has clearly showed the two-level game theory. So it is a lot of diplomatic complacency when we're just negotiating at central level just to move, to push forward the chapters, to move forward, and we need to move forward. But at the same table, there can be also the other stakeholders involved, which are civil society actors, local governments, and um, various associations of interest uh, of local stakeholders and national stakeholders. Um, maybe I'll stop here. Thank you very much. That was a very good overview. Um, not only overview, but you uh, uh, designed a concrete framework where communities can become a driver together with other actors. I think what is very important here is trusted communication. So uh, compliance, accountability, that is also something which is based on trust. And here the self-governance has a big advantage. If we can bring into the self-governance the, the people who are really concentrating on needs of the locals. And, and here I only want to mention for the discussion that when it comes in the next time, after the war, I don't know, during the war, f to local elections, we should also think about the codification of the electoral law for the local level, how actually to engage maybe not party lists in the village with 500 people, but how to engage individuals who are in who are want to do something in their community. So that direct democracy at the lower level, I think it's also... So what, what I only want to show with, with that example is that our panels are very interrelated. So we have very to do a complex approach. Um, Sviatoslav, I, I come to you and um, because you have, of course, a very... So I would say that by means uh, of the example of energy infrastructure and decentralization of energy, we can make our observations here very concrete. Um, um, so, so it is a big challenge. Uh, what we need to get more resilience is we need to decentralize the energy system. And here is also the problem of the relationship between center and local level. Yes, when you see the electricity, Obel and Nergo systems, which are still working. And on the other hand, we need to encourage also the community with more competencies to, to sell energy, to buy energy. So that, that is also something. And um, then we have the, the things... Um, we need a, a mixed production to be resilient uh, from, from uh, alternative uh, energy, biomass, uh, geothermal energy, battery storage, and all these things very important. Sviatoslav, um, my question to you, uh, what are for you the main obstacles for local structures, municipalities to implement energy efficient initiatives? How we can overcome these obstacles and how we can strengthen the position of the community when it comes to the energy resources is it will it will produce in future thank you so and 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 how maybe we also spoke already about international cooperation i think actually when it comes to decentralization and resilience of energy role models of partner cities can also be very helpful so so maybe you can a little bit elaborate on that thank you thank you so much thank you for inviting me for this opportunity to talk about the topic I was always a proponent of that the money from the international organizations uh, would be directed not to the government but to a local level because because the speed of the implementation uh, of different projects on the local level is is far better then if you go through the ministry, through the central level, but the ministries also have their role here because they can remove the obstacles 
that are hindering our cities to work efficient, to be fast and efficient. And that's why we have this huge need for dialogue. And the bigger part of the projects are implemented by business, by private business. And we have, uh, we have examples, for example, Zhitomir, one of the cities that is uh, that was being shelled, it was not as critical, but the energy infrastructure was targeted, especially the energy infrastructure. And the city uh, started thinking about the, some reserve capabilities to maintain the functioning of the city. And thanks to different sponsors from the US, from Europe, uh, the city could, could um, establish some cogeneration of energy, some facilities. So uh, the, I mean, uh, gas power plants that can be uh, taken into operation very quickly to produce uh, the uh, energy needed for the city. And uh, they could establish about four megawatt of energy production in the city and also thanks to the local business, local companies who were acting uh, very self-sufficient uh, and they were also buying the equipment. They uh, built about 20 of those facilities. So, and that's why uh, we are talking about that, of course, every city should have this communal providers who are providing warmth and water. And But at the same time, we should create uh, this uh, environment where the private investment can uh, work and can be efficient. That's how ca we can scale and this development can become faster. And all our joint efforts from our international donors and sponsors in they are supplying us with these cogeneration facilities for energy generation it's combined about 150 megawatt of energy but the needs our needs president was talking about it recently, uh, so it's tenfold what we really actually need, the amount of energy supply. So now we can clearly see that without private investment, without private companies, we cannot solve this problem. Without adjusting the tariffs, we cannot solve the problem. The private investors won't invest in generating uh, electricity and other energy because this these tariffs that we have now, they are not economically uh, economically uh, justified. They are just not profitable. So we should remove the obstacles for private investment. Uh, then only then we will be resilient. Our country we will be resilient. And it's about political dialogue and more uh, more uh, responsibility because this is also about increasing the tariffs for electricity and for heating. These tariffs now are strictly regulated, also gas, natural gas. So the previous round of discussions show that it is deeply politicized. It's a political question, and our societies a bit paternalistic, and this discussion threatens our political leadership. And this is where we should really start thinking economic about economics. And here, the civil society and different organizations are, are really uh, valued partners because the cities are really tired and exhausted. Their budgets are exhausted. And when the state is uh, establishing these really low tariffs for water, for heating, and the cities should uh, really uh, adopt these tariffs 
and they do not even cover all the expenses. How can a city, how can city budget even function? And uh, this is where the deficit is really gaping and the communal, uh, uh, the communal um, city companies, city-owned companies, they have big troubles. And if we are talking about energy efficiency, I would uh, mention two really important points, not two more, but uh, the cities are very unequal depending on where they are, what uh, if we talk about Jatomer, Ivano-Frankivsk or Vinnytsia that are relatively safe. They can strategically plan, they can uh, try and play with the strategic planning more mid-term, but uh, most cities that are on the left bank and closer to the front line, uh, Zaporizhia, Kramatorsk, uh, Kharkiv, Chernihiv, Sumy, all those cities that are being shelled constantly, and they have this question of surviving. It's not just about resilience, it's about planning for today and maybe a month ahead. Of course, they also think about long-term perspective, but it's not really doable in these conditions, under these conditions. And if we are talking about how we can help these cities, if I would have an office in Lviv, in Western Ukraine, if I were an international organization, or I would also think about Zaporizhia or Kharkiv, and uh, of course uh, the they should have more support because they are really in trouble. The companies left, business is leaving. They have decreasing budgets and tax income because of that. They have not as many possibilities to establish and to uh, develop their communal uh, providers, and they should, they, they must survive because their survival is about the survival of the country. Uh, uh. And another point I would like to make uh, is in regards to the qualification. So we also already reminded corruption several times during the previous panel discussion. And let me say, for sure we have this problem in Ukraine, but I would not uh, say that it is dramatically bigger than other countries have it. For example, the police chief executive in Spain was caught by a bribe of several thousand euros. So other countries have like quite the same problems. But what we have special is the perception of corruption. Uh, Ukrainians are very intolerant of corruption and corruption in uh, state authorities. And uh, they tend to hyperbolize these problem. So if we would speak about the international co corruption ranking, uh, we would rather speak about the international co corruption perception rating. So uh, the Ukrainians are usually critical about the perception of the authorities. But there is one important thing here. We are used to call things corruption which are actually not corruption but a result of a lack of competences and qualifications. Uh, for example, a tender procedure which resulted in uh, high uh, prices, not obligatory, uh, is manipulated. Sometimes it means that there is just no qualified personnel in place who is capable of uh, accomplishing this standard procedure uh, the right way. So many people just uh, they blame the authorities of being corrupt, but sometimes it is not about corruption, it is about the lack of qualifications and the absorbs capacity. So the uh, our capacity to absorb funds, this is also a result like a a consequence of our uh, qualifications and in an element 
of the overall transparency of public money management. And this is where we have a problem. So the qualification of personnel who, which deals or that deals with uh, procurements, normally these people don't have enough uh, qualifications. Uh, Thank you, Svetoslav. We would like to uh, have uh, discussions with the uh, public in here. Thank you very much for many interesting insights and thanks for your analysis. But before we go into discussion, I would like to address uh, Mikola Rubchak and uh, ask you a question which we are troubled with. How do we want to use Ukraine facility money for communities? And uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Rubchak, that your ministry, and we, as we all know, your minister is freshly uh, appointed, and these processes can be also very fresh. I would like to ask you if you have a proposal as for a possible mechanism that Ukrainian communities could use to be able to spend that money regarding to the re re to the um, European Commission's opinion on that matter, where it is really important that the communities themselves participate in decision making within this mechanism. So this is to say, do you have any proposals in that regard, and whether you already have some meetings with community representatives to speak about that matter. Thank you very much for that question. It is really important. Unfortunately, it goes beyond my competences somehow, because allocation of money is something that I'm not directly dealing with. But uh, there is already a mechanism, in, a mechanism in Ukraine. And as far as I am concerned, the following resources, the following funds will go through that new established mechanism. Why? Because uh, this mechanism defines that the projects which are being funded through it is not only funded due to a decision of Verkhovna Rada or min Cabinet of ministry, the Ministers. They also have to go through discussions on each level, regional and, uh, and commu communal level. So there is or there must be a commission on each level which includes all stakeholders from the authority, from the local government, from the uh, civil society. And those commissions are looking at the materials conveyed by the communities. So basically, the community applies for getting this that funding and there are standardized forms there are there is a list of documents they are supposed to um, attach to their application form well I think that Ukraine facility funds will follow these procedures well and it is due to the usage of that instrument that witnesses that it is highly transparent and open. Hypothetically, bearing in mind that uh, we have a war going on, I personally think that if some projects deal with security issues, or if they have dual usage, uh, the openness of the tender procedure or tender documents may vary. But anyway, we already have a mechanism, dedicated mechanism for that. 
Thank you very much. I think that is more than enough for us, and it gives us um, an idea what what your approach in this matter may be. So another point. Well, let me let me add. Excuse me. In ten minutes, I have a meeting, I'm participating in a meeting of uh, the minister and the council of city mayors, and I have to be there. Sure, we are almost finished with our panel discussion, and we will follow to the discussion with our public uh, members. Thank you. Are there any questions? Let us take uh, three questions. Uh, I think there is Mr. Brückmann. Maybe you can shortly introduce yourself. And uh, we take the question. And also, uh, because we are limited in time, please note uh, to uh, uh, who, who you want to ask. Hmm? Yes, we take the questions together, and then we go we go round. Yes. <coughs> Hello, my name is Matthias Brückmann, and I want to ask about two words you used in the discussion. I'm a member of the board of Recover Ukraine. This is a peer-to-peer -peer journalism project and we try closely to follow up corruption in Ukraine, also on the national level, but also on the local level. And we try to bring together EU journalists from EU countries and uh, from Ukraine. Um, and as you are in the very beautiful district of Berlin Pankow here, uh, in another function, uh, we are building up our district partnership from Berlin Pankow with the city of Rivne or the Oblast of Rivne. Um, and this leads me to the second word you used, elections. There are also problems with corruption on a local level. The mayor of, the elected mayor of uh, Rivne was put aside by uh, um, the court of justice for a year, so that means he can't come back. And uh, he was followed up by the head of the local parliament, and he is accused by local media, but also by the accountant ch uh, chamber of corruption. So how to deal for us in the EU to, we, we are very eager to proceed in building up this partnership, mm -hmm. but how to deal with it if there are no elections uh, to, that the people have the chance to, mm -hmm elect a new mayor, uh, and for us it's better to cooperate uh, with organization and with, with uh, local authorities when there is not the word of corruption. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the next question here, please. So, yeah, Mike here in, on the right side. Yes, I'm Helga Lukoschardt from the European Academy for Women in Politics and Business, and we are part of this um, Alliance for Gender Responsive um, mm -hmm. Reconstruction of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I would be interested, I think, uh, Mrs. Skorik, thank you so much for your, for your work, for your uh, engagement. Um, how do you uh, integrate the gender perspective? Can you integrate us? concerning the participation in leadership positions. Mr. Yilge, you talked about direct democracy. I think there are a lot, a lot of brilliant women in Ukraine who can do decisions, but also in the respect of to integrate, yes, to, to, to address the needs of women, health, childcare, education, qualification, fight against violence. I would be very yeah. pleased if you can answer this. Thank you very much. Uh, question about the gender aspect. Then we have two further questions here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Paul Hockenis, and I'm a, a contributing writer for Foreign Policy Magazine. As I understand it, 40% of, of Ukraine's power this winter was going to come from seven nuclear reactors, uh, none of which are in Zaporizhia. Um, we also know that the Russian military is going to hit critical infrastructure and energy uh, supply. Um, if substations are hit, those that supply power to nuclear reactors for their cooling operations and others, and generators don't pop in, meltdown could begin in, in one hour. To what extent are local government and civil society also involved in the discussion about the safety of these reactors? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question about energy infrastructure, maybe for Sviatoslav then, and then maybe the last question here, please yes. introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Witold Sartorius. Uh, I was German uh, government advisor in Poland from 91 to 2007. Uh, first for the, for the Hubert Foundation, later for the uh, German Federal Ministry for Economy in the Transform Program and later for European Commission. And from 2008 uh, I, until recently, I've been advisor on European integration in Georgia. And uh, I have déjà vu on experiences from the 90s, from 2000, and also from Georgia and, and especially from Poland. And uh, I wanted to thank Mr. Uh, Pavliuk for mentioning two key issues which have not been mentioned before. One is absorption capacity, because we, are, we keep talking about money, Ukraine needs, but all this money, it will not help if Ukraine cannot absorb it properly. This is a huge bottleneck. There are many bottlenecks which are not really approached properly. And closely connected issue is capacity building, what he also mentioned, which is closely connected to the issue of um, absorption. I can tell you, I just looked up before this conference a few data from old times. When Poland joined 2004, uh, joined the European Union in 2004, and received first big funds, it was only 6 billion euros at that time, the absorption capacity in 2005-2006 was 18% for regional development fund and for uh, not much more for the cohesion policy. Okay. And the years after increased only up to 50%. And this was after four years of candidacy process from 2000 and lots of activities, capacity building activities done before. My point here is that we should be talking immediately today about starting capacity building on a big scale, not waiting what happens there, because this is very cheap investment and it definitely will be useful, whatever happens. And also, last point, I don't know if you're aware, but there are studies by the European Commission and European Parliament how much administrative capacities you need to implement European funding. This is about one person in the system per one to two million euros. So take the 50 billion of Ukraine and count how many thousands of people well educated you need to properly absorb European funding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that was rather a comment, but maybe here can be a comment on that. Uh, so who takes a question with a lo corruption on local level? Michaelina, do you want to act? Because I think we can divide our... Yeah, uh, I'll try. <laughs> I'll try to do first two. Um, um, so uh, when we speak about the corruption, um, like, in fact, answer is very simple. Because if we do digitalization and collect data, that's the database, how, what you could analyze and compare, and you will see the level of uh, corruption or the risk of corruption. And, uh, but um, you know that we have this uh, dream system, but it doesn't work well yet. Uh, uh, but that's, uh, at the moment, that's the database of the projects. You could see the price, you could see the expectation, and you could see uh, the results of implemented project. So we need to uh, build the team uh, which will be analyze and control that. And also we need to build uh, prioritization of the projects which will be financed in future. And that's uh, where we are and uh, on that uh, teams are working. If we talk uh, about the local level, that's, uh, I think that's, the answer is strong civil society and the public control. Because um, uh, with um, public control, we could uh, understand and we could stop projects with high corruption risks and we see uh, good samples at the local level as well. And it works. Um, is it an answer? That's great. Uh, thank you. 
if we talk about the gender, <laughs> we don't have the complete answer, but we are on, in process. And we um, do uh, what we do in Bucha, Irpin, and Hostomel, that's uh, for us uh, some kind of pilot. Because we um, do the project office as a project first. And because we discovered that we don't have enough uh, project managers to implement projects. And our first project manager, uh, managers were women with kids. Uh, we trained them, and they did very well with, uh, for example, very new um, uh, psychological support pro projects for our region. Uh, so, um, politically, I believe that situation will change with uh, the next election very much because, uh, because of the war and because we have lots of women ready to come in power. Because we had this 30% quota uh, on previous election, but very often women were on the list but didn't become uh, deputies, didn't take the responsibilities because men were like more responsible. But now we have this threat when women are ready. And uh, if, we, if they will receive enough support from the families, from the society, they will take the responsibility and we will see big changes because now we see that where we have money, for example, in Kyiv region, in the richest communities, we have men in power. Where we have a lot of troubles, we have women in power. Mm -hmm. typical, typical model, but the uh, situation is changing. We have a lot of deputies, women deputies now in all communities who are smart, well-educated, English-speaking, and they uh, take responsibility to help men to do this right. Thank and mm -hmm. I, see, I see the solution on next election. Thank you so much. Uh, Clara, maybe you could comment on, on capacity. capacity. Yes, so please mm -hmm. go on. Yeah. Uh, maybe first Sviatoslav on energy, yeah, yes. Sviatoslav, uh, there's also a question to you uh, on energy infrastructure yes, and about capacities. It's a comment about capacities. Maybe you can answer what you want to answer. If I may, I would like to comment on corruption because it's very important. It's the moment when the West pursues or perceives the inner political problems as corruption, but it's not about corruption. The problem with the mayor of Rivne that was mentioned, it's important to understand details. The mayor of Rivne took on someone in the city council he employed someone who was uh, there in the election campaign. And as this person was uh, um, working in the city council, he uh, got uh, um, some financing, but also for one time. And as from my, my point of view, it's not about corruption because city mayor can form his team, he can invite people. If people are good and he can pay once a year uh, some additional payment, it's okay. But after that, the whole conference in Berlin is talking about the fact that the mayor is corrupt. I think it's uh, some inner political issue and um, so that's why I would call on you. If you want to talk about the corruption in Ukraine, you, you have to go deeper and understand the processes. Another example, for instance, in Lviv. Lviv is building a big biogas uh, station. It is financed by uh, international partners and uh, in the procurement process, uh, the partner, after the full-scale invasion, said that he will not work anymore if uh, the risks are not insured. And it's additional 10 or 20 million. So European company can do it, but 
in Ukraine, the media said that Lviv is corrupt because they paid the company 10 million. So we don't have a corruption here, but we talk about the Ukrainian cities who are corrupt. So Svetoslav, we understand. And please, if you want to comment uh, on the f so because we have to come to an end. So Ukrainian atomic station, they were producing 60, 70 percent. Today we have eight, uh, nine reactors and two in the western of Ukraine, one in south Ukraine, the largest uh, um, is uh, um, is with six gigawatt is in Zaporizhia and um, it's occupied by Russian Federation. When we talk about the safety of uh, atomic stations, I understand the the sensitivity in Germany because uh, Germany um, had to pay for certain approach to the atomic um, energy, but this transition took 20 years. So the political decision was uh, um, made in, 20, in 2002, and the people in Germany or Germany had 20 years to implement it. Today, we have, uh, we need 15 gigabyte, and nine are coming from atomic energy. We can't just say we are not using atomic energy anymore because we need energy whether Russians will attack atomic station, I don't think so, but I think it's about the um, s maybe substation, about the transformation, about the systems of distribution of energy. So um, it's uh, not on in the station, but around the stations, and they already did it in August. The terrorists also occupied uh, Zaporizhia atom station. They um, also took equipment from the atomic stations. They are not acting according to conventions. That's why we have the situation. We have to assure air defense. So Thank you very much, Svetoslav, for your answers. We would like to hear more, but now I would like, we, we are lacking time, unfortunately. That's why I would like to hang over to Clara for a sh brief comment. What of an answer to the gender participation question as well. Um, and of course, it is important to, ca to have uh, quotas in place to encourage gender participation, especially in politics. But I think what's also important is to have leadership programming. Um, we've done a GMF for 15 years now, regional leadership programs, cross-national uh, programs with local and national leaders, many of them female political leaders. And what I can tell you is that that is a fantastic way, and Mihaila was referring to that peer-to-peer -peer transfer, that is a fantastic way to empower them to, to strengthen their voice domestically as well as internationally. So I think that's also an angle that we need to be mindful of, not just in Ukraine, but also what we can do together. In terms of capacity, I think that's an amazing question. And I've been working on that in Romania uh, after the EU accession. And it's always a question of the, uh, the hen and the egg. What should come first? Should um, you know capacity come before the funding comes or the funding drives capacity? And at the end of the day, it is a virtuous cycle, and I think there is much to be said with regards to building capacity through project implementation. But yes, I give you that there is um, a human resource scarcity in Ukraine because of the war. Um, many other countries are facing that uh, in terms of local governments from different regions, where um, you know demographic challenges consist of economic opportunities, not just war. So there is that type of demographic pressure that leads to a very important challenge challenge for local government to develop talent retention strategies. So if we want to develop certain strategies at lo local level, I think one of the most important is how local governments preserve really competent people in place. And you know, we have some of them fortunately here with, uh, with us today. But then mm. there is another aspect that I can share. It's the last uh, one. The yes, last just, just very briefly that I can share from our data. So we've collected data on interest, inf 
ability to impact local communities and various capacity variables, resilience variables for all stakeholders across 20 different localities. And what we found is that interest trumps capacity. So if local actors have a, a vested interest in promoting the well-being of their local communities, that's a, more of an explanatory variable of their ability to create a positive impact than various levels of capacity. And we can look at financial capacity, human resource capacity, organizational capacity. And on that front, I would just like to highlight the fact that local governments and civil society actors in, in Ukraine have a large degree of capacity at the present time. So we see eight, over 80% of our respondents considering civil society actors in their community to possess a high human resource capacity. Then we see over 70% of respondents in, in Ukrainian communities believing their local governments possess a high human resource capacity. And similarly, over 80% of our respondents believe that civil society organizations have a very high organizational capacity. They have procedures in, uh, procedures in place, they have know-how. And I think these are elements that show money can reach local communities because they will know what to do with it and they do have a certain absorption capacity that should be improved with the 2.4 billion uh, euros of technical assistance that are currently in the Ukraine facility. Great, I think that was a very good outlook for a better future. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your contributions. Thank you both who were online with us for your patience and for your contributions. And let's continue in the next panels. Uh, vielen Dank, Wilfried. Auch thank you very much for the panel. So we have, we are already 30 minutes behind our time schedule. So we will shorten the lunch break a little bit to 45 minutes and we start here 15 minutes later at four o'clock in time. Please be here. The restaurant is outside. You go outside and then on the left hand side, you will find the restaurant. Guten Appetit. Really, really high discussion in the afternoon. Okay, so. Let's go. Everything was said during this conference, but not but everyone. So we will continue the discussion from this morning. And let me take my notes. So Wilfried Yilge managed the panel this morning and I will continue in with these ideas with our discussion here and we will continue the discussion from the morning and the question of uh, budget reform problems of municipalities in this context and other topics mentioned in the morning will be discussed here, but our focus point is of transfer of knowledge. Because this, we have representative here in this room who have made a lot of experience in their uh, own countries. Krzysztof Stanowski in Pol Poland, Laurena Svajcinius from Lithuania cu currently working and in, 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 in Poland, we have a representative from Ukraine. Galina will give us a, a, a pre, a pre, a short presentation experience from a very important um, city in, in Ukraine. And last but not least, we have on, in our panel, Mrs. Ulrike Hopp-Nishanka, who will give us the view from the German point of view. Okay, the room is quiet, so let's start, Krzysztof, with you, with your short introduction. Thank you very much. Um, when we are thinking about the subject, it's somehow, somehow the crazy situation. 70% of EU legislation should be implemented on the local level by the local governments. At the same moment, in EU, 
we have no way to influence the countries in what way local government is organized. And local governments has nothing to do in the in process of the negotiation to access uh, the... I see the, micro the translation is not working, yeah? yeah. Uh, no, I you uh, 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 Okay. It's okay? Could we, con could we continue? Is the Ukrainian translation ready? Yeah? One second. So. Budemo čekati. Oden moment ne pracuje še ukrajinska. Nie. Did that means that we should talk in two languages? Should we powinny govorit odnočasovo na dvoch mowach? Dobre, jak se tak? 70% majemo dužo divnu situaciju. When you will fix it, please inform me. Majemo dužo cikavu situaciju. Z odnogo boku majemo situaciju, v kaj 70% zakonjiv jaké je v zakonami Evrosojuza, vprovadžajúť sa mistevým samovredovaniem. A z druhého boku Evrosojuz nemá je nejakého vplyvu na mistevé samovredovanie v državách členov Evrosojuzu. And in this, at the same moment, we have the situation that Uh, local governments are not participating in any way in the process of accession. Mistewe samovredovania ne maje nijakoho učastja v perjavorah na vhod v Evrosojus. I it's a nedužo prosta situacija, this is quite complicated situation, and few comments about that, i dekilki komentarjev. Perši, jaki widnosit sa do mistevo samovredovanja v Ukrajini. The first concerning the local government in Ukraine. Bez pytań gromady asociacje mistevo samovredovanja powinny starate mate spilne stawlenie, spilną pozycję do državy do Eurosojuzu. The first of all, the local governments represented by the associations of the local governments, we have four all Ukrainian associations of local governments, should have position, should have the way they um, should, should have the position about the accession process, about uh, negotiation positions, and this is definitely uh, extremely important. Na žal, na sjodnišji moment, asociacije misteve samovredovanja do cego ne gotove. Ne dozrive še. Me čuje pozicijo asociacije mist Ukrajine, no dužo redko i na nacionalnem uzrivnje, a specialno na mižnacionalnem uzrivnje, asociacije misteve samovredovanja vestupajo razem. Uh, and this is the situation when, unfortunately, as for today, uh, the association of local governments are not presenting the same, the same position, joint positions. We had uh, Mr. Swobozhan, who was representing one of the associations, and he never said, uh, on behalf of all the associations, he said, my association, this is, this is our position. The second, if I can. Drugie, to jest zadanie, jakie jest dla miejscowo samowredowania w zachodniej Europie, w Eurosojuzie. The second is the uh, role, the activities which should take in the Western, Western Europe. We should be absolutely sure that every community in EU has links, has partners in Ukraine. We should be absolutely sure that the European 
assistance, it's not delivered from the Brussels to the uh, Kiev, but from European um, uh, citizens before Ukraine will join European Union, from the citizens of European Union member states to the local communities, from the community of Lublin to Vinnytsia to Sumy, and in the same way with, with other partners. Це означає, що є дуже важливим, щоб ця допомога, ця відбудова, цей процес входу в Євросоюз був побудован на тим, що е, громади з сьогоднішнього Євросоюзу і з України починають співпрацювати, що вони здійсняють спільні проєкти, що, що вони допомагають один одному. And in this way, um, people from the Western Europe, from today's EU member states, will better understand the Ukraine. And on the other hand, um, the people from uh, Ukraine will better understand uh, European Union and how it works. This is really a big difference if you are in a lo local community uh, which is part of European Union or not. It's a fundamental difference. Ти живеш в громаді, яка є частиною Євросоюзу, або ні? I believe that translation works. Now it's still... So. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your translation, for your introduction, and I would like to give over to Galina, who is the head of the military administration of the city, to give us a short introduction if and if you could in translate it into English it would be it would be good and I hope in the meantime we can uh, uh, we can solve the problems no 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 the <laughs> yeah you will translate into in English yeah okay good доброго дня или доброго вечора Відчуваю, наскільки не вистачає сьогодні знання англійської мови, правда? І це, напевне, така сама велика проблема, яка сьогодні є для України, тому що ну, якось не вдалося вивчити англійську мову, але дуже добре, що сьогодні в наших дітей є така можливість, і сьогодні багато громадських організацій і фондів сьогодні надають можливість вивчати англійську мову. І ми зараз, до речі, у нас в Чулиській міській територіальній громаді також започаткували вивчення англійської мови. Це, безумовно, дасть нам можливості для співпраці в різноманітних проєктах. Мене спікер представив як голова Чуюської міської військової адміністрації. На жаль, так. З 2002 року я працюю на посаді міського голови. З 2002-го була обрана 5 разів. І з початку війни, на 2022 році, в жовтні місяці, наказом президента, було мене призначено головою Чуюської міської військової адміністрації. Орган місцевого самоврядування в нас працює так, як і працює. Всі працівники на своїх робочих місцях. В нас немає ніяких таких проблемних питань. Є основне завдання – вижити, вистояти і надавати всі необхідні послуги жителям нашої громади. Власне кажучи, чим ми всі три роки після початку повномасштабного вторгнення і займалися. Наше... Yeah. Mm. Hello everyone. Good afternoon or good evening. Um, yeah, you can feel how much Ukrainian people sometimes lack English skills. So we understand this is a crucial problem that we have to tackle at the moment. And in our community in Chubuiv, we already started lesson in English so that our children and our youth can um, communicate better with the outer world. Um, I have been introduced as the head of military administration of the city of Chuguif, and this is unfortunately so, because I have been elected city mayor of the city of Chuguif five times since uh, 22, and since 2022, I was appointed by the decree of the president of Ukraine, the head of the city military administration, and we don't have any problematic issues in our community apart from the issue of surviving. We all strive to survive. Yeah, the translation is working, so we can continue in, in, in Ukraine. So thank you very much for your flexibility.
And uh, you can see we solved this problem and we will solve other problems in relation with Ukraine. So please go on. Our municipality has 40,000 inhabitants and after the decentralization reform, some rural communities uh, joined us and Chuhuyev is a city, it's not far away from Kharkiv and uh, many people know it's the a birthplace of Ilya Repin, the famous painter, and uh, before the full-scale war we had lots of culture and activities. We had cooperations with lots of different funds and projects. So it, it's a really long list. We had really uh, good projects with GIZ, and it was about it was about culture, it was about schools and other really, really useful projects for our children. We also have created a rehabilitation center, a chance, it's called a chance for children with special needs and our Ministry for Regional Development together with the uh, European Council, we have won this this uh, project, we will want the right to implement this project. And the war has slowed us down, but it, not, it didn't stop us from working, but we felt this terror of war from the first day on. The missiles came the first day of war, 150 and 50 apartments were ruined in the first uh, days and hours. Also, a critical infrastructure was targeted at once, and uh, we had no shelters. Uh, people were hiding in cellars. At that point, we had no shelters. And now I am really proud of our team, of our colle my colleagues and my deputies. Everyone was working that day seven o'clock in the morning, we were there at our office and we were thinking about how can we keep, uh, how can we keep the city going, the town going, the life should go on, how can we save our people. Children were in shelters uh, and or in the cellars and we were, we understood that it's uh, now about uh, distracting children, keeping them safe and keeping them sane and we were uh, trying to organize some uh, <coughs> materials for them to draw, to read, to entertain them. And uh, also uh, members of my team were visiting uh, our people in cellars and lots of them were ill because it was so cold. And But we survived. Those first days of war were really critical because we didn't know what awaits us. But in summer we have already started started repairing our infrastructure and we have been asked many times the war is going on why are you even rebuilding something but we saw that people our people were willing to return to their cities to their homes as soon as they could and now we have a re recovery commission going in our city so we help people to apply for state support for the damage that they have, uh, that they, for c the compensation, and we now are in the third winter of war. We are getting ready for the winter, but you know our enemy is really vile. They are targeting our infrastructure, and for the third war, we are now preparing for the worst scenario. For example, if we have no water, we have no heating, where, uh, how can we supply our people with uh, drinking water? And in the first winter, we were um, manufacturing these really small heating and uh, so we also <laughs> were um, supplying people with uh, timber because we understood that they can, uh, there's no other way of heating now and uh, 
we were manufacturing stoves and like, makeshift stoves, but then already in 2022, we started building shelters, equipping the shelters with uh, the, uh, all the sanitary facilities and ventilation because we uh, were understanding it's about the it's about the health of our inhabitants and it was f uh, funded from our state budget and from our city budget, regional budget. We also have really good connections to the Czech Republic. Uh, it's about energy efficiency. Uh, we could we could buy six cogeneration facilities that can supply us with electricity and heating at the same time and now we can produce up to 75 uh, percent of electricity even if there is a blackout in our community then it's also very important about the health the protection of the public health we are uh, responsible for kupangs for borova and for Wovchanske, for all the uh, townships or um, small uh, towns around us and we also get wounded soldiers who are being stabilized they come to us and then they are re redirected to other uh, bigger hospitals so that's why it was really important for us that our that our uh, hospital is really autonomous a water supply so uh, different ways of heating pellets and uh, different other ways and ensuring we have constant electricity together with the uh, mi military administration of the Kharkiv region. The challenges are really numerous, but our team is not stopping and we are doing everything possible to, to, be, to always be a step ahead. So we are not confronted with a situation where we just don't know what to do. We just cannot afford it. We are constantly preparing for different scenarios. And this year, 1st of September, we were, we had to, uh, to celebrate our first day of school, the 1st of September in shelters. But it was, it was uh, really a celebration anyway. So the enemy is really conducting this war in an unhuman way we can really say that but we are living uh, children are born in our community 140 uh, 84 children and the children go to school they are learning and we have to ensure this even if it's in shelter but it's everything uh, thanks to our young men on the front line and we are also supporting them we never forget about them warm clothing food children make socks or cookies and this is a gesture that it just comes from the heart to the heart of those young men of those uh, people uh, who are protecting us and however hard it is now we just have no right to give up we uh, believe in our soldiers and our army we believe in you who are supporting us and I would like to thank you. We have lots of our citizens from Chuhuif are now in Germany as well and in Europe and thank you that you are supporting us, that you don't are not afraid to help us and I am sure we will survive and we will continue the reforms that were started before the war. And regarding the uh, partnerships with uh, European cities, of course we have uh, the these partners already but w I think it will grow when we get the opportunity to develop to develop mutual projects that benefit our community and our European partner communities I th and I want to thank you again thank you thank you very much for this impressive uh, introduction and uh, I will give over to uh, Ulrike Hopp-Nishanka from uh, the German Ministry of uh, Economic Cooperation for a short introduction. Please, over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon to all of you. I think this is a very, very, very timely discussion that we are having here today, um, because I think, can you hear me? Ah, now closer, okay. <laughs> very timely discussion, and um, uh, I want to build on what two colleagues here said already on the floor. Um, Germany has been supporting the decentralization process and self-government right from the very first days uh, and was there to support after the revolution of dignity uh, this very strong will for uh, of Ukrainian people to uh, move towards the EU and also uh, fulfill the acquis. Now if we look at the situation of municipalities in Ukraine today, they are really in a tough situation and Alina with all our heart and respect, I have to say we are all with you in this struggle every day. Thank you. You described very well one, I think, of the key functions of all municipalities every day in Ukraine today, which is to remain resilient and support the people and preserve cohesion that the communities stay together and they stay strong in the communities and also in unity of the country, right? And this is maybe your most important contribution that was there right from the start of the very first days of the full invasion, but it's also still there today. Now at the same time, you are burdened <laughs> with a new challenge. And this is as important because the municipalities will be key to the EU accession process. Only if the municipalities manage to show that they are ready for accession in the Europe, to into the European Union and fulfill all the obligations and regulations that are there to demonstrate the ability to engage with the whole process and then implement all the obligations of EU membership, it will be possible to have EU accession. And therefore, it's really crucial to support the municipalities with all that we can to be able to do so. At the same time, also, there are two more things that you are all confronted with, and these are also very close to what we are working on. One is that, of course, for people to continue to survive and strive and see a future in their municipalities, there needs to be the ability to attract investment and maintain jobs and occupation on the ground, right? Only if there is business and economy working and there are jobs on the ground, people will be able to sell. So how to attract now funds for recovery and rebuilding and for investment is a huge task, both technically in terms of all these proposals that have to be written <laughs> and you know all the procedures one has to go through. Um, I think outsiders, other governments, your friends can help with that and that's a key element of uh, German support at the moment and since a long time to help strengthen the capacities to do so, but it's also about the resolve to continue on the political path of decentralization and implement the reforms that have been started. Um, and that is also a very political process, uh, and, and you alluded to that, and the question of what are the associations doing and who is, who is able to take uh, uh, a good situation and now uh, present a solution to an dilemma, and I want to close with that, because that is so important. Um, at the same time, the government, the, the central government in Kiev, is trying with all they can to, you know, reduce the budget deficit and attract funding. And the regulations and the rules how this funding can come into a country like Ukraine are highly centralized. It's all going through huge, you know, investment structures through the implementing agencies of donors and the international financial institutions with so many different regulations that this pulls a lot of the process that is necessarily to be fulfilled at the local level to the central level. 
and how to build that bridge that you know still the priorities of the people on the ground are listened to while the government brings in the funds uh, and needs then to ensure that they're distributed in an accountable way is, is the biggest challenge uh, that we can all hopefully try to address together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Laurena Svajcunas, director of the College for Eastern Europe in Wojnowice, a think tank near to Wrocław in Poland, a owner of the small, nice castle. Laurena, over to you. I don't know how relevant this is, but yes. Uh, to begin with, yes, I represent an institution that has a funny name. And it was founded by local government in 2001. So the city of Wroclaw, uh, the local government, Lower Silesian government, and some very important individuals to do Ukrainian propaganda. In 2001, already in Wroclaw, we knew that we need to do good Ukrainian propaganda. <laughs> and uh, as I like to say, Wroclaw is the most Ukrainian city in the world outside of Ukraine because currently there are 180, 150 to 180,000 Ukrainians living in a city of 700,000, so it's around 20%. And when people from Canada come and they say Edmonton is more Ukrainian, I say, no way, Wroclaw is the most Ukrainian city. So I will also say a few things that we have to do at home for to help Ukraine on this path towards European integration. And uh, to begin with, I think civil society and local government are the most pro-Ukrainian elements in Poland. I think they have the sensitivities, they understand it well. Krzysztof is a good example of the, all the work that he does in Lublin. I think we could find many people like that in Wroclaw who would even tell a better story. But now I, I go with, as a civil society, we also have a vibrant civil society that really wants to help in many ways. And now I think we have, uh, we can obviously list all the good things that have happened uh, and all the support that Wroclaw has done, has had contacts with Lviv and you know, when they were broke out, the, not the focus was not on Lviv, was actually looking wider and broader, you know, getting Lviv into all the European structures and so on. So I mean, we could, I could name, I could make a long list of all the things that we've been doing and the city has been doing. We could be talking about triangles. Uh, we've been working with Lviv as well, doing conferences to get, you know, German uh, local government, Polish local government, Ukrainian local government together in formats, you know, trying to find partnerships. Some of them are working, some of them, we have to be very open, some of them have not worked, but this is, this is just life. So I think I would just briefly, for the short introduction, I would d define, uh, sort of divide the two things in two parts. On the one hand, what needs to be done outside the local government in Poland. This is uh, what I would say, first, we need stable financing. Obviously, there is lots of goodwill and positive energy and everyone, uh, we could say, in many, many local governments in Poland, big or small, big cities or even uh, rural village type uh, communities, there's lots of goodwill to support uh, Ukraine. But the thing is, it's all about money and I think there needs to be a clear signal from Polish central government, but also from the European institutions that there is some sort of funding to do it. Because otherwise you have to sacrifice the funding, the budget that you have in your own pockets, the budget that you might even have from the tax, which makes you accountable towards your citizens. So you actually need some sort of central mechanism, financial mechanisms to support this thing. The other thing I would say, there also needs to be a clear legal framework in Europe and in Europe and um, let's talk about Poland so that the Polish local government has the right to send some of the money to war to Ukraine support Ukraine because in theory local government should not be focused on uh, foreign policy it's doing a very good job and you could s find many places but in theory there are always ways of you know sending uh, power generators there are ways of sending truckloads of food of whatever but i think this is all this is a touchy issue in poland and there's been discussions even under the new government how to change this the previous the government has been even more against the local government so i think uh, this is all uh, sort of a, a process the third thing i think uh, the local governments understand the need for solidarity in ukraine and i want to support but for many i mean there's been a focus on western ukraine and i think there's also needs to be a slight refocus Laurinas, over the Dnieper. Laurinas, the translators are ah, slow big down under brick pressure I now okay, you try to put the 20 minutes of your presentation in 10 minutes, but please okay, give good. a chance to translate. Good, I'm very sorry. Uh, then I'll just go on to the other thing, which is I think more important. I said this is outside and we can talk maybe later during the discussion about it. I think sort of 
broadening our horizons and uh, seeing somehow far behind and also learning from the Ukrainian cases on how we could prepare and be more resilient inside our countries. I think uh, uh, very often the relationship has been a teacher and a student with the Ukrainians having to learn how to attract investment, the Ukrainians learning how to do social services, which are very important. I'm not saying that they're not important, but I mean, there's been this uh, very strong rhetoric. I think there's also a need to understand how we can learn and our uh, local government institutions can be more resilient. And I think there's more and more awareness of this in the European Union, especially in countries like Poland, Lithuania, to an extent maybe uh, Germany as well. Uh, but now I'll go to the other side. I think for a city like Wroclaw and many cities in Poland, I think what's really important is to do the homework. We have all these Ukrainians who have come after 2014, because that's why we should also mention it. The, f the biggest part of Ukrainians who came to Wroclaw, that was after 2014. After 2022, people migrated to places where they had friends, family, and whatever. So that's why we have this big community. I think there needs to be a strong focus of local governments, and this does not require sending money outside of the city or outside the community to actually invest in social cohesion within the local government in Poland so that we can maintain strong support, which as the war drags on in any country, you know, there can always be problems and it can be declining to an extent. I think the local government can also invest in training the people who have a Ukrainian background in preparing for eventual reconstruction, in making them uh, one of some of the leaders when the time comes and when there needs to be more support in building the capacity. I think this is also a case about teaching Ukrainian children who are now at the age of, I don't know, 13, 14, getting them, integrating them with the, with the Polish com sort of colleagues, friends at school, because in a few years, those are the people who will be taking care of the EU accession process. They are the people who will have the potential, they have the, the experience. So I think, and the thing, also supporting civil society, I always say that the less uh, at the end, you know, civil society has to be at the very sort of end of everything, but I think uh, these civil society institutions uh, have a lot of potential and it's important for local governments, which they can also do in Poland and many European places, to train for the future of EU integration for Ukraine so that they can also give the support. Uh, it's not, it doesn't cost money, uh, that much money as we've already mentioned during today, uh, today, so I think this is a sensible investment that we could be making. And I think Supporting the society, though, that they understand the benefits of living together with Ukrainians and then supporting Ukrainian war effort. But this is all a broader picture. Thank you very much. So, you can see we are in time. So, please, questions and comments. Who would like to start? Please introduce you in one sentence. Oh, on the right side, the micro is going the lady in the okay please um dobry večer good evening ludmila melnik institute for european policy my question goes to uh madame minayeva i spoke to an organization monitoring the situation in the east of ukraine and uh, this representative had the following opinion that these territories do not need humanitarian aid so much because they do not allow people to uh, leave these territories. So we need to reinvent the humanitarian aid concept and maybe we need to force or uh, motivate people to evacuate so that the humanitarian aid can go to different uh, communities like to the west of Ukraine, for example. My question is, can you see opportunities or, uh, for the donors to change concepts of their aid for the eastern uh, regions of Ukraine? And second question, can you see opportunities to um, involve representatives of the Ukrainian diaspora? Uh, we have been spoken about capacity building and about lack of resources, that uh, we lack resources to really uh, support the communities on their way to European integration. So maybe uh, the Ukrainians abroad could uh, be involved into that process. To pick up t two questions more or comments? No? Okay. So if not, Please give the chance to Galina to, to answer. 
to answer this uh, direct question. Go on. Well, as far as I uh, have understood you, you were asking me about humanitarian aid, right? If we were to speak about our community, humanitarian aid uh, was key during the first months of the full-scale invasion. Currently, uh, businesses are working in our community and even new businesses emerge and people can get jobs. There are also um, places where people from different, even more dangerous regions live. So those who have moved from there and many uh, organizations of civil society visit those places and we take care for the residents of that facilities. Um, as for uh, other territorial communities, I cannot uh, give you any answer because I can only uh, speak about my own community. And what was the second question? Please. Diaspora. Diaspora. Um, I didn't quite understand your question. Can you repeat it, please? Can you see Ukrainian diaspora being part of European integration of Ukraine? Does it have any potential, in your opinion? Well, as far as I understand, do you uh, are you asking me if these people will be ready to come back to their communities and if we are ready to create uh, the needed circumstances for them to return? Well, I have already touched upon it in my speech. The people go back to where they used to live, when they have places to live and where there are schools and kindergartens. As for our community, I can I cannot say that it is quiet in our city, in our community, because the front line is not that far away. And now we are still working on a complex uh, rebuilding plan, reconstruction plan supported by uh, the USA and the UK. As an example, uh, the enemy destroyed our house of culture. We have demolished this uh, building and we developed a plan how we can um, use that territory and uh, we are going to build a building for uh, this uh, the service of provision of uh, social services. We also plan for constructing a residential house there. Um, and again, I will repeat myself, people will go to live there where there is housing and where there are schools and kindergartens. So we are taking these things into account. Uh, yeah. If I what? can, what language? Okay, let's try in English. Um, first of all, when we are talking about diaspora, we should understand that at this case, we are not talking about diaspora in Canada and US. So important part of diaspora. On other, this, the second comment is, it depends to the position of the diaspora in the local community in Western Europe. And we have some, some places, for example, in Lublin, uh, up to the level of deputy director in the municipal office, uh, we have foreigners and one deputy director, they are foreigners who are working not as cleaners, not as drivers, but as a part of the municipal staff in the city of Lublin. Such people has very important role to play in the process of your integration. They are practitioners. They conduct a lot of workshops. They share experiences. The next element, 
uh, about that is in what way we uh, use we use what role play local diaspora in building th this context with the partner cities and in several German examples, Polish, German, Ukrainian examples, we see that the diaspora is, is present and the local German um, city community is bringing them to the international projects. I have the great example from Belgium, uh, the city of Ghent won the European uh, Youth Capital title after Lublin and they brought Crimean Tatar Tatars, citizens, proud citizens of Ukraine, to the to the to the center, <coughs> and the finally last, uh, last 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 exercise I would like to share the experience in Lublin. We have in Lublin and Nancy, France, we we established seven years ago the European Center, the Lutheranian University and Lublin University established the special courses on European law in cooperation with five Ukrainian universities. So you can get double diplomas uh, with Lutheran, Polish and triple diplomas with Ukrainians. And we are this, it was established seven years ago. It's working. It's very practical. It's bringing together diaspora and people from, uh, from Ukraine. So we should use diaspora as we Poles use them in the Polish process of accession. Yes, of course. And I think it's a very good example you used, useful for the European integration. Because uh, integration is first of all in integration of law systems. And it's really important. So thank you very much for this example and over to you. Yeah, thank you. Just to maybe add to that and also but ask to ask questions back to you how it works from your experience. Uh, one is, of course, the, the skills that people can bring back or even from abroad maybe help. Uh, I was always wondering if there is not more we can do to deal with the lack of uh, 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 workforce uh, concretely um, by helping through online connection or through remote working procedures. Now I understand for the situation in Germany it's highly complicated uh, because of differences in salary so people uh, would uh, either find work here if they do, the occupation uh, percentage is not so high in Germany compared to for example Ukrainians in Poland so this is an issue in itself but then also how to connect to the situation in Ukraine and maybe support uh, people there is, seems to be not so easy as, as it looks like from, from the outside. Uh, so, but creating education, uh, bringing then expertise back to the country, accepting uh, an accreditation of uh, certificates and, uh, uh, and accepting them in both countries, uh, that is a very important thing which we, are, we were trying to highlight at this Ukraine recovery conference in June also uh, by, by launching this alliance trying to foster an understanding how important skills are. The other is of course I thought uh, maybe helping with investment because if people are active in their host communities and are working there they can help also bring along maybe uh, enterprise and investment and business. So it's not just about the municipal partnership between the municipalities that can help each other, but ideally also about the building a bridge to the local business in a, in a town that might get involved not only through donations, you know, of uh, all, all these very important supports, but also by investing. And I would be very interested to hear about uh, your experiences, if uh, what we can do to foster this, because you might be aware that uh, BM said the German government is supporting municipal partnerships between uh, Ukraine, between <coughs> German municipalities and other municipalities worldwide, but also. Of course, we are talking about Ukraine uh, for Ukraine. We have now, I think it's 200 
31 uh, partnerships between German and Ukrainian municipalities. They're growing the number every week. Uh, but we also want to use those in the best way by not only having the partnership, but maybe also bringing investment and funding along. Because you highlighted this, uh, how difficult it is also to bring the funding uh, to the Ukrainian municipalities. Thank you. Okay, give the micro to Christoph for short intervention. Short, after very short comment. How we can use the experiences both from diaspora and from Ukraine. Recently, I was organizing the study visits from uh, Ukrainian cities to Sweden and they were discussing um, security procedures, def local defense and so on. After presentation of Ukrainian partners, Swedes told perhaps we will present something next time. Uh, we should learn from that and definitely that means that many of the professionals, Ukrainian professionals abroad can be important, unique resource. Of course, they should learn English better, but being unique resource to build strong European Union and strong European member states. Laurenas. Briefly about business. I think... Uh, Wroclaw is not as good as Lublin when it comes to employing uh, Ukrainians in the city administration. Lublin is an exceptional city. But when you look at Wroclaw, Wroclaw, I would say, is a richer city and has a stronger business community. And the business is very much interested in uh, working with and in Ukraine because they have lots of professionals who have over since 2014 or even earlier have made through the ranks of the corporations of the medium-sized businesses and so on. There's huge potential and huge interest. But here, what we hear in, in our free time, we're also part of the local business associations as one of the a few NGOs. And what we hear from our partners in the business, the, here they need decisions at the central level. I mean, they cannot, uh, they need the investment guarantees, they need to have clarity and so on. So here I think the potential and the energy in the case of Rostov is much higher than in the legal side of things, but I think there is huge fear that about the situation and the security situation in Ukraine. Okay, thank you very much. Arthur, you have a chance for, oh yeah, please. The last chance to comment or to ask question. Could we have the micro? Hello. Could we have the micro on the, okay. Please introduce yourself. Yes, hello. My name is Natalia Prehornitska from uh, Alliance of Ukrainian Organizations and Open Platform. Um, and I have a question. Um, which, which key competences should be transferred from the central government in Ukraine um, to the local level in order to fulfill EU standards in the area of good governance? And how could a Ukraine facility be helpful in this area? Thank you very much. The last chance, no comments, no questions, so the last round to other, our speakers and Christoph, over. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite complicated, that means definitely we in Poland, we in Germany, we in France and we in Portugal can learn a lot about in e governors in, from Ukraine. Recently, you can get married in Ukraine through the uh, application in the smartphone. <laughs> it's not a joke. In the military situation, when you have uh, men and women on the front, it's important issue. It takes two weeks, more or less. But believe me, the Ukrainian refugee arriving in Poland Germany, France, Portugal, they pass through the technological shock. How unadvanced we all are. How limited number of things can be solved using your uh, mobile phone or your computer with your local government and the national government. And they are quite shocked when they get the question, do you have email? Uh, and this is the traditional question they get from our governments. That means, and I'm, I'm very serious about that, also when we are talking about local governments. In, in Ukraine, you have the 
application, e, e, e application, it's called DIA, which is the national application run by the government, but local governments can on commercial base join this application and have own part of this e-governance elements in this national application. It's far from majority of our uh, what's going on in, in our countries. And believe, believe me, I, I, I was signing contracts with 80 Ukrainian teachers employed in our public schools in March 22, and to sign them for them contracts in electronic signature was 10 times easier than to do that later on with the headmasters of school in Lublin. Similar here. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Please continue. Uh, well, no, I, I think this is now a does another discussion, right, of what we can learn. And uh, of course, uh, I'm I, who, I mean, you are saying this kindly that all of us, I think the Germans are uh, certainly <laughs> in, in dire need to catch up uh, on digitalization. No, but I think the question was also a little bit about what, does, what actually has to be moved from the national level to the local level, right? And um, I think this is a quite, a, quite a long list of regulations to go through. Uh, you just mentioned initially, right, when you started saying it's about 70%, right, of all the regulations that have to be actually in the end implemented at the local level, right? Uh, now, at the moment, um, I think your question is also about, about something else. It's about uh, how do local communities get involved in the accession process and how are they actually being consulted also, both in the process of negotiations and preparations to what, uh, and then also in terms of building the capacities for implementation. That is another question, and I think one that... Um, probably requires a deeper look at sort of the, the principles of subsidiarity and which uh, tasks in an understanding of a multi-level governance are actually allocated and should be allocated at what level. Now, since the decentralization process is not completed fully, I understand that there is a certain lack also of clarity in some aspects still that would require actually within the Ukrainian legislation to be carried on and defined. That's how far I have learned from Professor Milbrad, who spoke to you earlier. More, I must admit, I cannot really explain about this. Um, but this is, I think, the process. For us at the moment, I think it's very important to understand that um, the multi-level governance system really is a challenge also in the current situation and therefore um, there is a reluctance I feel personally uh, when I observe the situation now as, as still as a newcomer uh, to, to carry on with uh, decentralization because the burden of um, fulfilling the, uh, the funding requirements right, and the financing for recovery and rebuilding will create such a pressure uh, for centralized planning and prioritization on the one hand and also create a huge challenge in terms of governance to be displayed uh, with regards to accountability and transparency. And I think the importance is that one has to be very clear that accountability and transparency and integrity is not about at what level you implement certain planning processes because integrity and accountability and transparency have to be uh, fulfilled at all levels, right? It's not sufficient to pull certain decisions then to the central level saying it's easier there because we can prevent uh, corruption there. You have to prevent that at every level anyway. And therefore, I think it's very important to build up the capacities at all levels. Laurenas, would you like to? Kalina, final word? Uh, regarding the devolving of power and to the local level, we have talked a lot about decentralization. 
So on the local level, there are a lot of responsibilities, and it's also uh, very comfortable for uh, residents, uh, so they can receive public services at one. It's like a one-stop shop, and we, as a local government uh, officials, we employed uh, this service center in order for people to be efficient and to receive efficient uh, service. So thank you also for your compliment regarding our services in Ukraine. It, and it's of course very comfortable today because we have a phone and you can pay for everything from your home via app and it's uh, very comfortable and useful. When we are talking about public services, I could also highlight that recently we have opened um, resistance center in our municipalities because we get new challenges and we have to react very fast to these challenges. That's why we create uh, and implement these platforms. We have people who um, go through education and they work with certain uh, vulnerable groups of people and provide them with support. And uh, 2002 and 2022 and and this year and last year we had um, I would like to express my gratitude because we could send our children for some projects uh, to our partners um, internationally and it's also good um, so our children can meet other children can get some rest and also go through the medical procedures and health uh, procedures and it's very important for them and it's also because it's also about their future also the question of education of our children is very important our teacher show so they edu so now we have uh, an online school si schooling system but the quality of the education for instance, from last year, we have 18 children who are A-plus students in our community. So we see, despite challenges, our teacher teach and they try to provide with a high quality education even during the war. Thank you very much to all of you for the interesting discussion. So I will give back 15 minutes to you for the break. Stefanie, thank you very much for the invitation. And you can see on such a panel that the German-Polish cooperation is working regarding Ukraine. And our foundation, Foundation for German-Polish Cooperation, is supporting such a project. So I would like to invite you on our website and uh, maybe we will see each other in the next project in the next year. So thank you very much and... Well, thank, you th thank you, Cornelius and the speakers. We continue in 15 minutes here with the last panel uh, on security. Dear colleagues, guests, please take your seats. We're starting the final panel of this year's Cave Dialogue Conference. I know the talks are important, but we also have some very important issues to discuss today. Uh, my name is Anna Kravchenko. I'm the head of Ukraine office of Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, and I will be moderating the uh, final panel today. And um, the No Reforms Without Security is the title of this panel, and I think it actually captures very well the dilemma and the interplay that um, the Ukraine is actually facing at the moment. So, um, having some issues with the translations, everything working fine. Okay. 
So the EU demands a long list of uh, reforms um, from, uh, from Ukraine. And um, while Ukraine is actually fighting this war, this existential war with Russia, and it faces enormous challenges to its security, sovereignty, democracy, and especially at local level, as we have heard today during the previous panels. So the question is, how can Ukraine balance the, those immediate security concerns with the reforms that usually are actually being pursued under stable conditions? And another layer of this complexity is actually added with, in the question of the Western support and this uncertainty now with uh, the election in the United States last week. So with the coming second, upcoming second term of Donald Trump, because he has previously signaled a rather less supportive stance towards Ukraine. So um, the question is, can Ukraine count on continuous support from the United States? Or is it time for the European Union, for Europe, to level up its support to Ukraine and show real leadership? So the discussion today will examine how the European Union and Ukraine can navigate those challenges. And the key questions are, can Ukraine realistically implement the EU required reforms while defending itself against Russia? What additional support the European Union has to provide to, to Ukraine? And how can we here in Europe and Ukraine as well prepare for possible challenges or changes in the uh, um, foreign policy in the United States. And to discuss those questions, I have a very uh, uh, distinguished guest here, and actually it's um, Solomia joining us because I don't see her on the screen. Can someone from... She's coming, okay. So um, today uh, on our panel, uh, very well uh, gender-based panel, uh, <laughs> balance, uh, <laughs> we have uh, His Excellency Mr. Oleksiy Makiev, Ambassador of Ukraine to Germany. And we have Ms. Solomia Bobrovska, member of the Verkhovna Rada of Ukrainian Parliament in the Parliamentary Committee for Defense Security. Uh, I hope, uh, Ms. Bobrovska, you can hear us. Um, we have Mr. Alexander Müller. Um, yeah, I'll show you. Excellent. Welcome. We have Mr. Alexander Müller from German Bundestag from Free Democratic Party. He's the head of FTP group in the Defense Committee. Um, then we have Mr. Ruderich Kiesewetter. Um, also member of German Bundestag, member of Foreign Affairs Committee from the Christian Democrat Union, CDU. And we have uh, Mr. Markus Welsh. He's a documentary filmmaker, publicist, and analyst. I will start my first, I will pose my first question to uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador Makiev. Your Excellency, the last week um, has been quite turbulent, intense in Germany and in the United States. How is the perception of the last week's events in uh, Ukraine? What are now the hopes, fears, or the expectations? Well, it's, it's one, two, three, no? Can you? One, two, yes. Well, as ambassador of Ukraine to Germany, I would prefer to stay in Germany because you give us uh, also enough reasons uh, just to be uh, to be uh, alarmed uh, or or uh, simply laughing out loud on uh, on the way and the level of uh, discussions uh, here in Germany. Uh, but we are at the at the key of dialogue. Uh, so dialogue and debates is something you Germans are doing really, really great. So I try to uh, to jump into that uh, dialogue. I'll tell you a story. Uh, last week uh, I've been together with uh, Minister Minister Baerbock in in Ukraine. 
Uh, and if you ask me uh, about turbulent, intense times, it was a uh, really turbulent, in intense night uh, in, in Kiev, as all the nights uh, of, of last uh, half a year. Uh, there were, I think, only two days in the capital of Ukraine, Kiev, without uh, air raid sirens, without uh, drone attacks and rocket attacks. So we meet with the delegation uh, at the breakfast buffet in, uh, in the hotel, uh, and, and all the members of German delegation, not, not many of them have been uh, that often in Ukraine as, uh, as minister herself, uh, because she was for the eighth time uh, in, in Ukraine. So they, they approached me and, and, and asked me, how are you doing, Ambassador? How are you doing? Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm fine. How are you doing? Well, actually, we, we spent uh, the whole night in the, in the bathroom. Uh, according to, to our security arrangements, uh, it, was, it was a drone attack alert, so we need to be bet between two walls. So that's, that's, a, uh, that's a rule in, in Ukraine. So we actually spent the whole night in the, in the bathroom, and we think about how, how would we survive this very long day uh, today. And I asked, well, why don't you ask how would those drivers survive this day who would drive us throughout the country from the very morning down to the late evening, some 400 kilometers to the Chernihiv Oblast uh, and, 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 and further on. Okay, I just did not rem uh, tell them that we Ukrainian uh, maybe were not that much into German uh, um, uh, security uh, 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 demands, uh, but still, uh, well, for for myself, uh, it was a funny story, but not for my compatriots who are uh, spending uh, all nights uh, in fear, uh, whether they need to go down with their children or uh, or not. So after having such a night, uh, if you will be asked uh, uh, somewhere, uh, the public debates or in the German Bundestag, would it be appropriate uh, to allow Ukrainians uh, to hit uh, the, the Russian air bases and, uh, uh, and uh, ammunition depots uh, from where Russians launch uh, these uh, barbaric uh, attacks, the answer would be fallen uh, much, much easier. But this is not not the case. And uh, you know, when I when I ar arrived two two years ago, uh, I I loved to uh, to use that uh, Duden uh, Wort des Jahres und uh, Unwort des Jahres. So the uh, and, and back in 2022, uh, I told that the, the uh, Unwort des Jahres uh, was Ringtausch, so ring and chain exchange when we got uh, all the, well, seasoned uh, equipment uh, uh, instead of, uh, of new uh, modern uh, one. Uh, well, I would say to my perception and to perception of all the Ukrainians, there are two major candidates is German angst, uh, what we do not accept, and of course, uh, um, Besonnenheit. <laughs> Sorry, with Besonnenheit you would not be able to shut down uh, Russian uh, drones and, uh, and rockets, and this is not the answer in the intense and uh, turbulent times. What we need is the word leadership, but unfortunately, my call uh, to, to German politicians to show leadership, uh, to get inspired uh, by Ukrainians uh, fighting uh, the war, uh, to, to be motivated to take over in times of uncertainties uh, in, the, in the United States. This is happening uh, on the European continent. So this is our war that we need to win, and this is our freedom uh, we, we need to fight for and uh, to, to regain it. So uh, this is uh, how, how we in Ukraine uh, accept uh, the uh, uh, uncertainties uh, here in Germany. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you also for your very clear words. Uh, 
Ms. Bobrovska, um, can you give us a current overview of, of the situation on the front and um, tell us what are, from your point of view, the most urgent needs of Ukrainian army at the moment and what priority should the European Union set for the next months? I hope you can hear me. Just let me know. Now so we can please. hear you, yes. Mm -hmm. um, my speech, I would say, and my perception is very gloomy on what's going on in Ukraine. Um, I'm sorry, but I did the translation in my ear. Yeah, can I switch off? Um, oh, please talk Ukrainian. Um, um, well, what our ambassador just said, I don't have to switch. You can, you can speak in English. Okay, thank, you, just... thank you, thank you. Yes, of course. So, first of all, um, to, to add to what uh, um, our ambassador has said, uh, for the last three months we had more than 4,300 shepherd attacks on Ukraine. Um, that's their new, uh, new approach to terrorize Ukraine, because that's this, um, this attack is combined with, they like to combine with, um, with the missiles in order to exhaust our air defense. So I would say the first one of the first priorities and top priorities that's to strengthen um, Ukrainian air defense. Seventy percent of of what um, of them we we managed to to strike. And by the way, it's ridiculous. But the only state uh, except Ukraine, which is um, uh, which is um, which strikes actually the the Shahed as well, that's Belarus. Unfortunately, not Poland, not Romania. And that was one of our key requests now to our neighborhood states um, in order to support our um, air shield. That's the first point. The other one, if you go and look at the map, front map um, of Ukraine, where we have more than 1,200 kilometers of the front line, um, the last combat actions, um, unfortunately, um, mm, took more territories for the last two and a half months than for the last two and a half years. That's showing that Russian troops are very successfully on the front and what we are losing starting from the Kharkiv region and now one of the unfortunately very painful things we, we, we've heard the news uh, in the morning that the um, air assault uh, troop in the Kupiant, that's the very east of Kharkiv region. The same we see in the next region, the same, the same and the big offensive operation that started on Zaporizhia. Zaporizhia probably you know or heard as a region which um, um, we had the, the nuclear power, the power plant station in Narodar. And to be honest, the next year, while we are worrying, because um, the, the one thing that's, that's the, the, the Trump's victory, his, his, um, his view, um, on the negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. Um, but the problem is that, and the point is, that Russia is not ready to uh, negotiate. They are very successful on, on, in Ukraine. And their plans for the next year uh, are very um, clear, and for us obvious, we know them. And, and that's to surrender each, every uh, region on the western, on the eastern shore of a deeper river. Um, and that's a huge, uh, not a challenge and threat for, for Ukraine. That's, that's the whole big question, how all our allies will respond um, to, um, to, to, to that. I'm sorry, I again got the, the request to talk in Ukrainian because I, I hear my translation in my ear. It's, it's, it's up to you what language I'm not sure. Uh, We're talking about shahets and drones and combined. Uh, 
One important thing, if we're talking about the these combined attacks with missiles and drones, this is really few people understand why are we talking about the Shahets and the drones because it's really important. It's 50 kilogram of explosives and the Shahets, they are three meters long. So it's not some small uh, really fly, but it's uh, really dangerous object and one of the most problematic things today is our ambassador already mentioned it we are not quite clear where the american politics is going moving towards what development regarding europe and other countries so we would wish for germany we ukrainians for germany to show more leadership and not defend this prohibition to uh, target uh, Russian territory, the military objects, they wouldn't always say that this is escalation, because we have gen enough escalation already. And it is about Ukraine existing as a state on the political map of the world. And now we are about to lose, or the threat is looming, and we are hearing so often uh, from the German side, unfortunately, uh, they are s formulating it like this. Ukraine cannot lose, but uh, Ukraine should win, but they are not telling about that Russia should lose. So it's not clear enough, this communication. It, it's what we would wish for. And what is also important n now, we have more than 700,000 troops, Russian troops on Ukrainian uh, ground and uh, who are active in combat, 700,000. So it's huge, a huge number. And we, if we are not sure that the help will be constant, that our allies will support us. If we are not sure every moment, we cannot stand. We cannot defend ourselves. So uh, this uh, is uh, all from my side. I will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you. Mr. Welsh, you have been extensively traveling to Ukraine and documenting the war since 2014. And uh, as we've heard, the amount, the number of um, air attacks on Ukraine is, uh, has been raising. So every day there are, as the ambassador said, just two days uh, in the past months that Ukraine wasn't attacked um, from, from the air by Russia. You analyze the data of the aerial attacks, so you also um, analyze the use of the weapons, what missiles Russia is using. What are your recent findings? What the data is actually showing us? Um, what exactly is missing in Ukraine? And from your point of view, are the allies, the EU, doing enough to help Ukraine uh, win this war? So first of all, ah, it sounds much better. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, to m make a big database, explain in one sentence, uh, it's actually nothing so much new. Uh, Russia is um, to preparing for bigger strikes. Uh, what we see the last two months is more or less a uh, preparation for the winter. That means it's absurd, but uh, there's actually very few uh, cruise missiles, uh, attacks, um, much less than in the month before in August. September, October is a preparation. But unfortunately, it, is, uh, it was the highest amount of uh, flight objects attacking um, Ukraine civil um, um, aims. 
um, what means that uh, Russia managed to just get the air defense very, very busy and using the munition what uh, Ukraine needs actually for bigger strikes will coming up in winter for sure. So that's the bad news. Uh, many things you could explain, for example, that, I mean, war is a race with time. So both sides try to develop as much as possible and both sides try to change their tactics as best they can do. And there are many positive things. For example, in last weeks, uh, Ukraine communicating quite often, uh, often how they um, put down drones. Uh, drones is the thing what happens the last two months most. And actually, we see the last days, it's over 50% of the drones uh, get down by EW, electronic warf warfare, so that they just uh, attack them with uh, technical equipments before they get to the city, so it's good news. Um, but many things are changing almost every week. So the, the bad news is that um, the glide bombs is still a big issue, especially for the cities and especially for the soldiers in the front line. And Russia adopts some techniques so they could strike Zaporizhia. And that means if we don't do something on this level, uh, Ukraine will def ha definitely have a very hard time in the next month. Um, let me put it a little bit in a, in a brighter picture because we will not probably discuss technical issues here in this, but asking what can we do now in this weeks, in this month, and that Ukraine will survive the winter. Um, the need of Ukraine is not a secret. Uh, since the summer of 2022, it has been clear that this is primarily uh, artillery war. And uh, even if it takes a very long time in Germany to realize what we have to do for that, it's uh, still the, the par uh, it's like the most important factor if it gets to the very war. And we have to finish this war, and uh, I'm very happy that you used the, the framing, or um, the colleagues in, in Kiev used the framing, we have to win this war. This is actually the, the, the problem number one, I see it in Germany, because uh, we don't dare to say that we, are, we or Ukraine must win the war and Russia must lose. This is one of the things what, what you can see in every discourse that this is lacking. And this is a very speci special German attitude. If you go to the other countries, if you travel to, to I mean, just other partners in, in East and North uh, Europe, it's a completely different framing. So, the second thing, what, uh, as a, basically Ukraine needs a lot of artillery, Other, otherwise everything is, a, is an illusion. Second is that, uh, it's also not a mistake, uh, a secret, is that armed vehicles are a big issue. That makes just how long you survive to get to the front. It's for both sides a big issue and it will be in the next year uh, a major question, how much both sides are equipped with that. And the third one, and this is like nothing, also nothing new, is that uh, Ukraine needs definitely more um, interception ammunition to shut down drones, cruise missiles, and especially, and this is a very specific uh, question, um, ballistic uh, missiles. Um, but the problem number one I see, uh, to finish this first uh, input, is that there is a lack of uh, overall strategy how to win this war in, in Germany and in the German debate. Um, <laughs> I was last week in, in, in Poland, had a lot of dis uh, discussion with colleagues there. They, they discussed it completely different, much more to the details, much more knowledge about uh, military things. I miss this, and this is a very strong thing, what I just also put in this community. We need more profound military discussions also in our community, because it makes it for some politicians in this country so easy to, to go along with their no strategy, because nobody pushes on this level. Um, the second thing what is, has to be changed, and it has to be changed very quickly, is the attitude uh, towards money in Germany, what it costs to end this war. If we don't go for long-term and large orders, uh, we will never get the ramping up what we need to produce enough stuff that Ukrainians survive. And everybody who says something else and this next election campaign will be a lot of wrong uh, um, uh, ideas, we have to have a strong hand to, to explain why this has to be done, otherwise we have a problem, and not only with the war in Ukraine. I mean, this is probably not so much spread in media. Bundeswehr is preparing for an attack of Russia 2029. You can debate why they, to put, uh, they picked 2029, but it's a clear preparation for something what we avoid. And if we wait longer to save money, not to get our 
uh, um, uh, private contractors willing to invest in bigger ramping up, we will have a problem in two, three, or five years. Um, let me put one last thing why it's so, uh, why I think the, the biggest problem is not about the talks about how much uh, ammunition Ukraine needs, but, uh, but the, the big lack of a strategy debate. Um, in this round, we don't have to waste time to discuss uh, what it means when the federal government was not able to support Ukraine in its deep strike capacity. Um, let's go back to the people living on the front line in Ukraine. They are, uh, the, the light bombs are something what you cannot intercept. But uh, these light bombs come from, from airports and um, if you look to the, the expert debates in, in the US, uh, I was astonished that the ES, uh, W, like the Institute Study of Wars, is openly taking opposition to the U.S. government by showing in the details how much capacity V had, would had have in August to strike 200 logistic points with the weapons already, uh, Western weapons inside Ukraine. What happens if we don't do that? We give Russia uh, the biggest present what they can get because the main strategic goal in the war is to make problems to the other side that the other side does wrong decisions. And we make it for Russia so easy to do this war because we are not willing to cause problems on the Russian side. This two <laughs> it's really worth to read these very short uh, comments what ESW puts every day on the, on the websites. And in August they were taking for days and days this debate, what you can do and how Russia would have a problem if we would attack on the Russian side these 200 logistic points. They have to move away certain units of air defense as well. We, only have, we have a completely wrong debate in Germany about this war. We're only seeing Ukraine as a victim and stop talking towards how Russia can have problems. And Russia could have easily more problems if we're willing to really fight this war with Ukraine and not having something between pity and uh, let's send what we have and not going into deeper strategies. That's my first point for now. Thank you very much, Mr. Welsh. You just mentioned uh, the upcoming election campaign. Mr. Müller, Alexander Müller, um, until last week, your party has been a member of the governing coalition. So, um, now we are, pro we are heading towards the new election, we are heading towards new government. What will be the priorities, demands of free Democrats uh, in regard to Ukraine and what will you do differently to your time in the government? Mikro, bitte. Ah. The green light is on. <laughs> so, um, it's this, this one yeah. is better? Okay. Uh, we want to fix the, the errors that the, the government uh, did in the last uh, three years. You know, um, it already started in the, in the beginning of the war when um, the, the, the former uh, Defense Minister Lambrecht said, we will deliver 5,000 helmets. And uh, we all thought, uh, what a shame. Uh, for Germany and we had to fight very tough fights to increase uh, what should be um, delivered. It was, it was a fight that Greens and Free Democrats, um, uh, to be correct, of course, uh, the Union, the Conservatives al also wanted to deliver tanks and this took one year and uh, Olaf Scholz until today still does not want to say Ukraine must win. He just says Ukraine must not lose. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, an, an important uh, difference and um, this is what we want to fix. We, we urge the, the government to deliver what we have. Um, it is not just um, tanks, uh, we could deliver more tanks, we could deliver um, Fuchs cars, uh, transporters for troops. Uh, we still, uh, we have, we have um, delivered 5% of our battle tanks uh, to Ukraine. Um, we could be more progressive in, in, in the support uh, of Ukraine and that's what we want to achieve uh, in the next months and with a new government. It is um, somehow weird like when, when Olaf Scholz is in Washington and makes a deal to get um, cruise missiles from America, Tomahawks, um, to Germany 
uh, they are lent by um, US Americans uh, to Germany to, to protect us. And Olaf Scholz seems to see that it's um, necessary for Germany to protect itself, to have these cruise missiles, to make deep strikes into um, uh, uh, another country that, that might attack us. But he is not willing to deliver those cruise missiles to Ukraine who also need this. And like Mr. Welch uh, uh, rightly said, um, uh, it is uh, the, the bombs uh, that, are, um, that race from airports in Russia and then glide uh, far away from the front line. They are, um, they are thrown far away from the front line and then uh, hit Ukraine. And they are so hard to intercept and, and to fight. Uh, it is a principle, shoot the archer, not the arrow. Um, uh, Taurus could make a difference. And uh, Ukraine says th they need this uh, system. And um, conservatives, liberals, Greens want to deliver this, but Olaf Scholz um, is denying uh, these weapons uh, to Ukraine. And this, this could be one thing uh, that we could uh, increase. We could uh, increase uh, weapon delivery, uh, we could increase um, international help. There is so much we, we could do. We could openly say Ukraine must win. Um, and um, then the negotiations now start. Um, um, Donald Trump has laid um, his, his plans uh, open, how he thinks the, the, the war could end. He says um, that there should be a Western Ukraine and an Eastern U Ukraine with a buffer zone defended by um, uh, European soldiers, not US, European soldiers, that's his belief. Um, and he th thinks uh, Western Ukraine should be, a ban uh, should be forbidden for 20 years to be part of NATO. Sorry, that is not my imagination of a stable peace. Th that is no stable peace. And Ukraine, w I'm sure, they will not accept uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, compromise because everybody in Ukraine knows what a Russian signature is worth. Uh, they had the Buda Budapest Memorandum, they had Minsk, uh, and Russia never had the, uh, uh, never wanted uh, this kind of, of peace. They just wanted to reinforce their army and to attack again, and that's of course what the Russians uh, will want to do. The, the only solution that uh, guarantees a stable peace for Ukraine is a NATO membership, and um, I think the new government should work towards this direction. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Akizaveta, you probably know what I will ask you. So <laughs> what would uh, your party's strategy be in, uh, in uh, relation to Ukraine, to war in Ukraine in the upcoming election campaign? Of course, you are striving to have a chancellor uh, after the election in February. What changes can we expect from you? Thank you very much indeed also for the invitation. First of all, I would like to applaud the ambassador who since more than two years, is trying to convince this government by politeness and clarity. But today, <laughs> with his statement, he also made clear that this government is not to be convinced by politeness and clarity. What we really need is a plan to show to the German population what is at stake if Ukraine is failing, our world is failing. And I would also like to plea that we should be very careful that also the new government is not seeking complacency. So it is not helpful to wait what might happen after the election because Friedrich Merz is so outspoken. Yes, he is. But some of you know a small booklet of Bingener and Vena from last year, which is called the Moscow Connection. And there are two parties in Germany who are affected by that. It's my party, both, and it's the Social Democratic Party. What we just see in Germany is a blame game, especially against the Greens, so that just normally there might happen a new so-called grand coalition. What I do not hope, because I hope that the liberals are strong enough that we can go together. But this Moscow connection is just trying since April 22 
to find out a separate solution with Moscow. Some revelations, revelations were in the media and also the names. The idea of this is a new name to find a new name for Minsk III, but to resolve the challenge by waiting and avoiding to pave the way of Ukraine to EU and NATO. And this then could lead to the idea that we might save money. Our country needs a loan for defense until 2030, another 300 billion euros, and to improve our civilian uh, resilience with bridges, digitalization of another 200 billion euros. So our complacency in the last 20 years has cost credibility, but also caused a weakness of our public infrastructure and a weakness of our defense. But the idea to save money by trying to comfort Russia will lead us into a war. So I will give an answer, but to prepare this answer, I also need to say how is Russia acting in Germany? They started drones from Gugi ships, which were five times faster than our police drones. They destroyed infrastructure, railroad infrastructure in the fiber area, two important knots. On purpose, two Ukrainian soldiers in Rizkolen Valesens were killed by a Russian agent. There are burnings of German armaments industries, there is delay in some smart needs we have, and there are burnings as well in containers who only by fortune didn't uh, uh, did not make uh, aircrafts burn. I say this because Russia is testing out us. And our chancellor yesterday has said, my politics and my policies have prevented us from escalation. Well, Russia is escalating to de-escalate us, to threaten us, to make us shy away, and to believe that we can convince Russia to stop the war against Moldova and the Baltic states if we succeed in avoiding that Ukraine becomes a member of NATO and has to hand over territory for the complacency of the EU member states and NATO member states on European soil. This is the complete wrong approach. So now to the answer. First of all, in my party, we have to be very clear to become so strong that we can select our partner. And therefore, we should have a stance. We should really be very clear in our politics, not to, I don't know whether you can see it, but I might show it, not to avoid the snake line or snail line, but to have the clear line between uh, the northern part of this small map and the southern part. What we cannot avoid, uh, what we need to avoid, is this imbalancing, sneaking around and trying to find solution. This is, this is the picture. Yeah. So what is necessary is that Friedrich Merz, the hopefully incoming chancellor, informs also the German public what is at stake. Peace, freedom and self-determination for us and Ukraine. Second, we do not support Ukraine for solidarity reasons. We support Ukraine because it is of the interest of all European states. And solidarity you can damage, but security interests you cannot damage. And therefore we have to explain that Ukraine is fighting our war. But the hybrid war, war is already taking place on German soil, on Polish soil, on Lithuanian soil, soil and damaging so souls. Yeah. So what I would like to say is we need to inform our public that peace, freedom and self-determination are at stake and that this is costly. So we have to reprioritize our budget. We have to convince the population that it is helpful that Ukraine is a win-win situation. Why? And this is probably also an aim to convince Trump. 
Ukraine is the country knowing what war is. They are withstanding for nearly three years against the third or second strongest army of the world. They are withstanding with lower means than envisaged. And therefore, this knowledge Ukraine has achieved, also in medical care, but also in shooter sensor fusion and any other things, should not fall in the wrong hands. And Ukraine must have a perspective in the European Union due to their resources to renew Europe. So I would not ask whether the European Union can demand something from Ukraine. We should ask where can we learn from Ukraine. And this is the way Alexander and me are working to improve the output of the next government. And that we are clear, if this government is failing, populist forces will win in 29. So a lot is at stake in Ukraine, and if we are not careful enough, also here in two or one years. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, um, first of all, Please feel free to comment on what the colleagues have uh, have just have just said. And then about Russia, I'd love to ask you, from your point of view, is there a strategy in the West towards Russia, and what is missing from the strategy? If there is a strategy towards Russia, what are you? What do you think has to be done to target Russia more in this war? Well, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, I would I would imagine if if the uh, the new composition of German uh, Bundestag would uh, be composed of uh, this kind of audience, we would have uh, over 700 uh, votes in favor of uh, delivering weapons and changing the strategy. Uh, and apropos strategy, uh, the major problem with the Western strategy is that there is no strategy. And well. Actually, every strategy needs uh, uh, at least three things. Is the honest evaluation of what is happening, what are threats, what are challenges. Uh, then a projection, what can happen if we do not do anything or if we uh, just rely on, uh, on, on our steps that uh, as we see uh, we're, we're not not enough, and the third is concrete actions. Uh, so we in Ukraine we have uh, this strategy, and is combining uh, uh, is combining military and diplomatic efforts. We need to win this war to make sure we are in a favorable position to. Uh, negotiate with Russia because we know Russia can be negotiated only from a position of strength. So uh, we, in our evaluation, our common evaluation, and I once again, I I try to be uh, here not not a just Ukrainian ambassador, uh, but as a European, and I'm talking about our continent because this is not just uh, uh, that. Russia declared a war uh, uh, to Ukraine, it's a war uh, towards the West. So Russia is in war with the West, take it or, or, or leave it. And uh, we need to be honest with our own population why we, we, we need to, uh, to act, why we need this strategy. And Roderich described uh, clearly what, what were those uh, Russian uh, attacks uh, on uh, on Germany in the in the recent year, starting from uh, from the uh, Tiergarten Mord and uh, and going on and on and on, so uh, Russia is at war uh, with uh, with the West and with Germany. So Germany needs to adapt uh, its uh, its own uh, strategy. Uh, and proceeding from that, uh, you you should stop. Just hoping, because hoping is not a strategy. As we talk to Germans, they, they, they all, well, many, not, not all, many of them hope that they would wake up uh, and there is no nightmare uh, at all. 
it would not happen. It would not uh, happen. Uh, uh, second, stop telling to the adversary what w you would definitely not do. <laughs> stop, just show the red line to the aggressor and stop encircling yourself with, uh, with, with red circles. Start acting. This is about security of, uh, of everybody. The people here in Germany, in Prenzlauer Berg, uh, in, in Berlin, they would definitely be not happy to hear a, an air raid uh, a siren whenever Russian airplanes start approaching uh, uh, the German uh, airspace and uh, your uh, Eurofighters uh, will, will be scrambling uh, every now and then. The Deterrence and the Tomahawk rockets, good analogy uh, here. Well, it's about deterrence, but you, you know you would use this weapon if needed. And the Russia uh, shall know that this weapon will be used, so please do not uh, attack uh, us. You will, be, uh, uh, you, you will get the, the, strong, the strong response. We are in a wartime, so uh, let's start. Uh, let's stop hoping and uh, start uh, acting. Ukraine strategy, once again, military strategy. It is in our common interest that Ukraine is put into position to negotiate with Russia. And I'm as, as a diplomat. Uh, I spent many years negotiating with Russians on on Minsk and in uh, in Normandy format, uh, and I. I, I told it quite quite openly. Every now and, and then, you go into discussion with uh, with partners, uh, as, as Germany and uh, and France, and uh, and with our American partners. But you can never be sure whether you would not be traded off for for a sake of compromise, because nobody makes compromise of your own things. Everybody hopes that Ukraine would go on compromise. And every compromise from, from our side, once again, it's not a computer game. It's not about territories, it's about people, uh, about uh, war crimes, and about uh, uh, saying, okay, we would allow uh, a new genocide in 21st century by agreeing on, uh, on Russian uh, terms. Is that really what you want uh, to be, to stand in the history books of 21st century, the complacency of, of the West uh, and, uh, and, and how uh, Russians uh, won uh, uh, an imperial war uh, uh, in the 21st century. So the strategy is clear, make an honest evaluation. My call on all the politicians in this country, be honest with your voters. Don't tell them peace, calm, don't pray for peace, but act for peace. That would be honest evaluation, uh, uh, the, the projection, uh, how it uh, would uh, be in re re respected or received in Russia, how, how the situation would, would change, and then concrete uh, actions without uh, drawing red circles around yourself, but drawing red lines uh, before uh, Russians. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Bobrovsk, Ms. Bobrovska, um, having heard everything what was just said, um, I want to just take a step, I don't know, a step back or step forward, and because the, the panel was actually also about the reforms that Ukraine has to take uh, to become a EU member. Um, what, from your perspective, is actually possible now in this time of war in Ukraine? What is already happening in terms of reforms? What do you think are the bottlenecks now? And how can we help? Before we will talk about reform, I would like to
to highlight something. We were talking about red lines, but elderly people might remember in their families. So there are some who only understand the speech of power. So, and it's important. One, so it's also, we also ask our partners to return educational missions, instruction missions to Ukraine. So, and it would be win-win situation because it's about everyone. It is about everything. It's about uh, tactic, about artillery, about drones. Ukraine is the first country in the world that uh, has uh, uh, that has uh, a new force in the uh, military. It's about a drone, and it's uh, not only about a drone coalition, but it's also if, if there was not the capability of Ukraine to produce and to operate the drones, we wouldn't have these strikes that we are performing today. So when Germany and uh, the US saw when we answered the strikes and the international partners ask us not to do that, but uh, today the situation, so we want to preserve our territory. Unfortunately, the voice, the sound is insufficient. So our German colleagues noted that the glide bombs, uh, they are destroying Ukrainian cities. So we have uh, drone attacks, artillery shelling, and then later the Russian forces come and destroy the territory. That's one remark, but coming back to reforms, in the recent months, unfortunately, Russian soldiers torture Ukrainian soldier, they recorded and posted on social media, and that is supported by people in Russia. So, and we need to highlight it. It's the war of Russia against not only Ukrainians, but different, but all civilized world. I talk to our soldiers that uh, came out from the Russian captivity, and they have some fertility problems today, and that's one of the signs uh, of the trauma. So, and it's one of the most hurtful aspects. And I'm not talking about uh, torture, about uh, all war crimes, about slicing people up. So it's about destroying our resilience. And I think these topics are really hurtful. So maybe it's not always about bravery. It's about psychology that not always can uphold when we are faced with such torture. But about the reforms, I think the situation is unique because we managing, we are managing at the same time to fight the war and to carry out reforms. And it's crucial for our EU accession, and it was also, it would, it's also important to get invitation to NATO, and I hope that Germany will um, also 
in favor of Ukraine to be a part of NATO. Recently, uh, there was a enlargement report released. It's uh, about our progress. There are some successful aspects, but there are some reforms, there are some anti-corruption issues. We have uh, some public moment situation, um, so we see some situation about corruption that become public, and um, but there are also some successful reforms because we begin to we restart our system and system functions. We are also talking about the capability of people, about the capability of local government, and it's important to support these communities, especially in the East Ukraine, in the Western Ukraine, the community are working good and we need to strengthen our communities. We have many discussions about also about the taxes, about the military tax, whether it should be on the central level or on the level of municipalities. But we need to support also our municipalities that are near the front line. We are talking about uh, smaller municipalities. They need not only support, but also some best practices some experience. We meet uh, heads of uh, municipalities. Uh, there are some exchange from Poland, from Baltic states. We ask them how resilient should be uh, municipalities. So we exchange some experience. And it's also about what experience can uh, municipalities share. So we are building bridges between partner cities on the level of municipalities or on the city or town level. But nearly Every head of uh, municipality are on their positions and they don't want to evacuate uh, their cities if it's still possible to live there. And it's our, they are our heroes and uh, it's actually really impressive that they are able to holding on resistance. So, and of course, sometimes the politician can reach an agreement, but the society are uh, issuing the last verdict when the society state that society is ready to resist. So in the first month of the full-scale invasion where people went to the streets and um, were ready to resist and to fight, that's why it's important to uh, listen to society. Thank you very much. Uh, thank yeah. you also for uh, pointing out actually the points. <laughs> the questions we actually discussed today uh, during the day. So um, invitation to NATO, uh, Ms. Bobrovska had just said. Um, Mr. Muller, how do you actually envisage the future of Ukraine, let's say after the war? Um, where do you think it's Ukraine's places in European security architecture and um, what can we do already now to ensure this future? Um, I think the most important thing is that uh, the future for Ukraine has a stable peace and a just peace. This is um, the most important thing. And of course, 
um, Ukraine must um, accept this kind of uh, what, whatever compromise um, uh, it will be. Um, this is important and um, Moscow must pay some price. Um, I think it's the wrong thing to go and say, let us freeze the border where it is now, make a ceasefire, and uh, after that we try to, to have a, s a stable peace. That would invite China to attack Taiwan, that would, attack, uh, that would invite other uh, autocratic uh, countries uh, who would see um, it is... Um, Yes, it, it, it makes you, uh, it, it gives you some uh, advantages to, to start a war, to, to move borders, and you, you get out with, with that what you, what you wanted. That ca cannot be the, uh, the, the solution. So Moscow must pay some price, and, um, and it must be stable. And I don't see any solution that would be stable and um, would last uh, very long without um, Ukraine uh, being in, in NATO because it is, uh, look at Vladimir Putin, he attacks his neighboring countries uh, but only those who are not in NATO. He, he does yet not dare uh, to attack Baltic states uh, or Poland where he for sure has, has an eye on and um, th that would be really um, a stable solution. I think um, Trump's proposal to have some, some buffer zone, some corridor, which would be protected by some soldiers, would not last. Because you would have to put soldiers there, and you would have to put soldiers there with happen heavy weaponry. Because otherwise, you would have a Srebrenica too. You remember Srebrenica, there were UN soldiers with light um, uh, um, guns. And uh, the, the enemy just went, went over them, and Russia would do that too. But if we uh, would have a buffer zone with soldiers with heavy, heavy weaponry, why not take Ukraine into NATO? What is the difference? So th this would be a stable, a stable solution. And in my view, we, we should have to communicate this to uh, Putin. Like uh, some um, um, panelists uh, already said uh, uh, today, do not tell uh, Putin what we don't do but um, uh, draw some red lines and tell him this is what you can expect. You can expect Ukraine being in NATO, you don't want this, so come to the table and um, le let's, let's talk. And um, also, yes, uh, threaten him. I think um, Ishinga's proposal is quite good. Ishinga has made the proposal to say, um, Putin, stop bombing uh, hospitals, stop bombing kindergartens, stop bombing the electric infrastructure. If you dare to do this again, we will release the Taurus uh, in, in the direction uh, of Ukraine. Fritz Schmerz also took this uh, approach, and I think it's, it's very good that the conservatives uh, also um, uh, took this approach. This would be a quite a, a clear signal towards Putin. That is what we could do uh, even today. And in the long run, as I said, I, I just see a, a just peace with uh, Ukraine in, inside NATO. Thank you. So, uh, with you, we would expect Taurus in Ukraine. <laughs> the Chancellor said uh, yesterday, um, with him, the Taurus would not uh, come to Ukraine. He restated that uh, without necessarity. I, I don't know why. We are in election campaigning uh, uh, already. Um, so, I guess with, with Chancellor Scholz, there's, there's no chance to have uh, Taurus in Ukraine but with another chancellor, and it looks quite uh, like we will have a change of, of government uh, in, in very few months, um, I, I guess the new chancellor will, uh, will be at least um, threaten. Uh, I, I don't think he will uh, uh, deliver the Taurus to Ukraine, but he will threaten Putin to deliver it, and he will do it if Putin uh, goes over a red line, I'm sure. Mr. Kieswetter, you wanted to comment on this. Yeah, very brief. What we could do now, even the current government could start with it, is to start with the training on Taurus. Because if we deliver it, the training will last some time. So start now. And we are very clear in our caucus that we would like to bring in, I mean the potentially future Chancellor's party, that we bring in in the coalition treaty already that we need to start. Taurus has become a symbol but it is a symbol for high-precision, long-distance weapons, which Germany is procuring for itself. And we will also 
have to start the training for Ukrainians instead of saying what is not possible. We could already have started it. And that's it. Well, the strategy is missing. It's not a war of Russia against Ukraine. It's a war of China, Russia, Iran and North Korea against Ukraine and our way of life. They want to destroy us. They want to partition us. And therefore, a political management would also be to say we start with training to have a leverage. And the second is we need to demand something from Russia. From the peace movement in Germany, I hear no word about the nuclear weapons in Kaliningrad reaching Berlin within two minutes. They are silent. So, but what do we need from Russia? I would like to put it in one sentence. Russia has to accept the right of existence of all of its neighbor states. So as Germany is accepting the right of existence of all of its nine neighbor states, which was not the case some 80, 90, 100, 200, 300 years ago. So this must be the progress other countries in Europe has, have achieved since 1990 that Russia has to follow the rules and also best practice. And best practice is not to keep an empire and to widen it and to suppress the own population and to send ethnic minorities to war, killing every day 2,000 and, and, and uh, own soldiers and destroying the rule of life the perspective of millions of Ukrainians. And we are looking, we are investing from the West pocket and we are looking from the home office. This we have to overcome. And I believe that we in my party, together with a smart coalition partner, be strong please, be st become strong, then we, could, then we could overcome it. If not, there is no romanticism. If there is a deadlock coalition, it will be a deadlock coalition. What is a deadlock coalition? A coalition of compromises, avoiding Minsk III, but also avoiding Ukraine being part of European Union and NATO. So please, to all in our civil society, mention it, bring it up, write letters to politicians, but also make up yourself publicly in the next weeks what you expect from the new government. This is one the, the NATO proofs it's microphone. Uh, I think we, the, the biggest mistake we could do is to wait what the US will do. Um, we have, we can count the working days until Christmas and these are our days, so we have to use them. Um, I know it's a little bit wish thinking, but uh, I had a long video call with Gustav Dessel yesterday night and he was trying to explain what he thinks could be done. Um, if we want to see uh, Ukraine um, being in a better condition, fighting this attack scheme against uh, infrastructure, we have to order a lot of uh, interceptive missiles. They're already on the way, they're good news, two good news. First, uh, 500 Patri Patriot uh, missiles are, will be delivered before this winter. I just don't know which one, but we have to order more. It's not enough just to order for the next two months or for the next three months. It doesn't make sense to speculate what the US government will do, but I think the worst is to wait. It can also be that the Republicans are not clear what they want to do, and it takes a long time until they come up with their real strategy. So we have to prepare for that. And Gustav comes with this fantastic idea to say, let's make the deals now with the Biden administration and buy as what we can have. We don't have to, buy, uh, to, to pay with the next 2025 budget. It could be also for a long way. And we have to grill all the politicians and the contacts we have because this is a question of weeks. If we wait until the next year, I don't want to know what the US government wants to have for a price. And it's not about money. It's also that they can blackmail us. So the biggest mistake what is, is to wait. So we have to grill our politicians with ideas what they will do the next 20 days. This schockstarre because US doesn't count. Either we want to do something for Ukraine and then we have to do it in the next 20, in the next 30 days, or we can cancel the next conferences. Second, we have a lot of potential with a new government also to make a better policy in Europe. What, is, what I always uh, 
I have a hard time that nobody talks about Finland and Sweden. This might be the next, that, that might be a much, much bigger picture of doing uh, politics in, in a big scale. And I, I really like this idea, uh, Mr. Kieserwetter was coming up. Germany is, uh, is behind. We are conservative, we are slow, we are old fashioned. And everybody's shocked coming from Poland, coming from, from Ukraine, uh, no, no matter if they have to change a passport, passport or whatever. But it has also advantages. Yeah? This is an old fashioned uh, society where you can approach people and influence people. I had a talk in, in the Bundeswehr uh, panel with one of your colleagues from FDP, and he was explaining what he has in his Bürgersprechstunde, however you translate that in English. And he said, like, there's a lot of things going on. So we have another, this election, everybody is afraid. No, it's a big chance. And we should go as soon as possible. And if there's 1,000 or 5,000 supporters of Ukraine in this country, and these 5,000 people would make uh, a personal contact with their people who get, wanted to get elected, then we have a 10,000 talks minimum. This will, we have to grill them. And we have a big chance. We just have to do it. So to wait for the next step is the worst thing. So we have to act, and every day counts. Thank you very much. Um, I imagine there are some pressing questions in the public as well. I already see a few hands. Excellent. Okay, then please, uh, microphones. Thank you. The only question concerning NATO. It's a good suggestion because Ukraine needs what is the sustainable security guarantee because of the experience you had with other guarantees. But unfortunately, as far as NATO is concerned, it's a consensus principle. Therefore, probably, you have to look for what we call uh, alliance, willing to come over with a security guarantee. Because you have Hungary, among others, you have Slovakia, and, and so on. Therefore, I think we have to fight for setting up an alliance, willing to come over with a security guarantee, more or less similar in its efficiency as, for example, NATO. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, Matthias Nellis, uh, German-Ukrainian Bureau. Um, of course, our German government, uh, our majority collapsed, and we have two opposition parties here on the panels, but I would be very curious to hear, and for the Ukrainians in this room, to hear from you what this means for the Ukraine policy in the short term. We talked a little bit about the next government, and obviously there are, uh, uh, Markus already mentioned, waiting is the worst strategy. We have months months, five, six months before, in the best case, we will have a new German government. So what will that mean for the Ukraine policy in the short term? With this lame duck government in this old parliament, is there a chance for some more Ukraine aid? And if not, you know, what are we looking at in 2025? What can we do before there is a new budget? Some expectations. And lastly, to Mr. Müller, because you're so, such a strong supporter of Ukraine, can we increase the support without taking additional debt? This is something that I'm, Mr. Kieserwetter is very forceful on. And I'm afraid it's difficult to maintain finances for... Um. Um, to answer your uh, first question, what, that, what does this, um, this period uh, without a majority um, mean? Um, there will be a time lag. Um, we have de decided in, in uh, spring, in summer, in autumn, we have decided um, to deliver uh, weaponry like um, Iris T, like Patriot missiles and so on. They are already ordered and when they are, uh, they are already partially paid and if they, are, um, they arrive, they will be delivered. And this will be with, uh, with some time gap, um, uh, th this, this is running. But we have no budget 25 now, so that means uh, starting in uh, January, and, and to my knowledge, we have spent everything that we had for this year. This were 8 billion, this is quite, quite some money, um, but this is already spent. Um, so as long as we do not have an, a new budget, uh, don't let yourself fool. Uh, the, the three billions that Scholz offered uh, last week were a lure. Were just a lure for Christian Lindner to accept extra um, uh, uh, borrowing 
which is not allowed uh, by our, um, we, we, can, we can talk about this, if this would be allowed, if there would be a way to make this uh, legal, but from our perspective, the offer from Scholz was not legal. And uh, it is infamous uh, to, to make a lure with, with Ukraine help and then tell the public, uh, our coalition has split by, because of uh, Ukraine help uh, and the FDP was not willing to. Th this, is, uh, um, this is just fake news. Um, so, but th this is indeed a problem that, that we do not have a, a government currently that can um, have access to, to, to um, financial um, uh, means uh, to support Ukraine. So, there will be a time gap. There will be some deliveries in the next month, that what is what was already ordered. But as we cannot order currently, uh, or Scholz can, cannot order even if, if he wanted, there are also some uh, um, possibilities, but uh, effectively he, he, he won't be able. So in spring and summer, there will be uh, scarce uh, deliveries. Um, there is a way, even without a budget, to deliver. Um, the, the rules in Germany say, if the government say, this is something we have to pay and it's urgent and it is uh, very meaningful, I don't know the, the words in English, um, uh, but then the, the finance minister, the budget minister can, uh, uh, do, the, do it this way and, and buy it, um, but it's hard because it must be defended. There can be some guys who, who sue him uh, in the court, so I think he will, uh, the, the, the rest government will be reluctant, and so there's just hope um, that we will have a fast uh, coalition talks, a fast new government, which will be ready to act and, and then ready to, to help. The second question was, um, are we able to to raise uh, additional money um, without um, extra budget, of course, uh, we are able to. Um, you know, we have the, we had those papers in the last weeks, those papers from Habeck, from Lindner, from uh, Scholz, how to, um, how to get our economy uh, growing, how to um, save already um, uh, all, all, all kinds of money within the budget. We have a budget of 488 billion dollar. Uh, euro, 488 billion euro. That was, um, th that is the current budget of this year and uh, in general was a plan for next year. Of course, you always find in inside the, the budget um, uh, means uh, to, to raise some money there. Also, Christian Lindner said uh, we are able, and we would have made a budget. We were very far into the, the talks of, of a budget. So, um, we, we had planned 4 billion and in this year we had 8 billion. Um, so having four or eight billion with, uh, to save and, c and cut it somewhere else is, of course, it's, it's possible. That's my uh, uh, opinion. Very brief, the debt break is not a purpose in itself. It's a technical mean to avoid further debts, especially in consumption. So the debt break could be easily changed with regard to investments, investitions, investments, sorry. Second, we have a security measure inside our constitution that's not the defense case, it's the tension case. It was never tried, never executed. It's Article 80A for those who would like to look. And this tension case can also be changed with um, cases of different uh, support. It is really very well explained in our constitution, it could be applied for that. If need be, also there is an interim government. Third, um, as regards the debt break, this allows anyway 50 billion euros, about 50 billion euros of debts in a year. But this government has invested it in, in the social welfare costs which is needed, it is helpful, however, not in this dimension as we have. So it could easily be prioritized. And that's also the way to NATO. Now we experience a chancellor, I'm in the opposition, it's very easy to criticize somebody. I don't do this. But look, this chancellor is heading a government and he gives the guidelines. And it is very difficult to overrule these guidelines. Even we in the parliament, with strong majority votes, asking for the delivery of high precision ammunition to Ukraine, were not successful because he said, I don't do this. That's his strength. 
Imagine the opposite. You have a chancellor who is saying, I want this. Ukraine needs to be supported. I want Ukraine in NATO. I will go the diplomatic means to convince Slovak Republic and Hungary that they give up their concerns. And they will give up their concerns if we speak with them in an, in an appropriate manner and if we offer them something. So I believe it is a question of leadership. Last remark, NATO. We need to explain that any other solution than NATO is much more costly and needs much more, you mentioned it, military engagement because any security agreement will be tested, any. And so either we send there some 10,000 troops upon invitation of Ukraine, we cannot send them by our own means, we need an invitation, or we invite Ukraine to NATO irreversibly and the, the practical membership is as soon as security conditions permit. I just would like to say the new government should be courageous within the law and not complacent and sometimes outside the law as we perceive it now. I will take a few more questions. Um, uh, the lady in Vushavanka. Good decision to, to wear my Vishivanka today. Thank you so much. Uh, Susan Woschek from uh, European University via Drina and Frankfurt Order. Um, dear Mr. Kiesewetter, dear Mr. Müller, uh, thank you so much for speaking quite clear here about uh, your plans, also about speaking what the recent Chancellor doesn't do, what were, was a clear failure, what a maybe future different counselor, Chancellor might do. Um, but I would like to, to ask you to be a little bit more clear. And as Markus Welsh said, uh, we don't have a couple of months that we can wait in supporting Ukraine. Supporting Ukraine is a need that is right now. And I know that you are pretty sure about that. Now, we had a government break last week and we have a government now without a majority. You know that. But still, as a parliamentary democracy, we have a strong parliament and there would be a parliamentary majority um, on a particular interest that you both share or your two parties share with the Greens and this is supporting Ukraine. So my very clear question and please be quite clear in your answer. My question is, will you invite still this year the Greens in the, in the German parliament to join you for a parliamentary initiative in the next parliamentary meeting, I think this will be in December, to start a parliamentary initiative. You three, you have 403 um, mandates together, so clear majority. Will you invite the Greens to start an initiative in the parliament to send Taurus immediately and to, um, to, ban, uh, to lift the ban on the restrictions on the weapons. Will you do that this year? Because you can. Okay. I, sounds great, gets a lot of applause, but the government doesn't do it and responsible is the government and not the parliament. And we have done this several times, several times. And it is very populist. Yes, we could do this, but as you know, we are now in an election campaign and it is a question of these parties and we have to ask the party leaders who are now responsible for this election campaign or they want to give this, send, uh, this signal yes or not. Yes, I personally am ready, but I know how, uh, how our system is functioning and therefore we need to be also realistic. But I have an answer to you and that's Europe. Now, one country is stepping in, you are in, in Frankfurt, that's Poland. Poland will have the European uh, presidency from January and Tusk is now collecting states and money to better support Ukraine. But what is he doing? He's outlining Germany on purpose because we are not reliable. 
and our parliament can do what it wants also if we start this. Imagine what will happen if we start this initiative and the chancellor says, no, I don't do this. We damage, we damage much more German reputation if others see this country is not able to act, this government is really too reluctant and the parliament has not the power to convince the government. What we need to do is, it, it is much more important now to go public, to teach the people, to convince them, especially in Brandenburg, Mecklenburg, Vorpommern, Thüringen, Sachsen and Sachsen-Anhalt. Why? Because they believe in a romantic Russia. They believe in Sarah Wagenknecht. Even in my party, they believe it's better to have peace with Russia than Ukraine is surviving. We have to name, shame and blame that. And this must be part of a movement. And I invite you and I come to every possible opportunity to speak if we arrange it two, three days earlier, that we go east and start this initiative to convince the people. If we don't do this, we will be under pressure when the, when the coalition negotiations uh, start because then Sarah Wagenknecht and others are organizing public demonstration, peace with Russia, no chance for Ukraine. That's the framing we are living. And therefore, we need support of Poland that we say, encourage us. We are waiting to have finally the election to join your coalition of this, this new, agile, innovative and more defensive Europe. Because this is the key of the Tallinn Initiative. This is the key and core of the idea of Tusk. If we don't do that, Germany will be singled out. And the build-up of Ukraine will not be done with the third largest economy of the world because they stay, we stay in pacifist complacency. It's much more important to convince the people to be, to, 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 not to blame, but to address the parties. Are you willing to receive uh, Ukraine in NATO? Are you willing to start uh, training with Taurus? Yesterday I spoke with a very responsible lady of the Greens and I asked her, please talk is I make it publicly now. Please talk to your party. Could we start a common approach that Taos training begins? Could you convince your party and then we could join? This must be the way now. So it's not very far from you, but you see the emotions on my side. Just, just one say, sentence. Uh, Roderich Kriesewetter is fully right. Uh, the Bundestag has not the power to deliver Taurus. Um, the, the decision must be made from the Bundessicherheitsrat, that is uh, some ministers, that is Olaf Scholz with some uh, ministers, and only they can uh, make this decision. Uh, the Bundestag has made several approaches already. The Conservatives have made several um, uh, initiatives, and uh, we wanted to vote in favor of this, but we were not allowed because we had a coalition contract, so we made a, an ample um, uh, initiative there were, uh, we were um, uh, talking about cruise missiles, long-reaching cruise missiles. That is already a decision of the Deutsche Bundestag. But the, the only solution is to make it short. We, we must get rid of Olaf Scholz and uh, then the way is open. Um, I always make this, this joke. Uh, um, I got two uh, new jobs uh, when uh, being here in Germany, uh, diplomat and then two new uh, as a uh, arms dealer and uh, psychiatrist. Uh, so in the psychiatry, uh, there is a notion of substitution. So when you substitute your, your emotions with something which would be more acceptable. And I see uh, this uh, uh, this trauma or uh, this, uh, this big dream uh, uh, of, of uh, a great uh, and peaceful uh, and friendly Russia and friendly Russians. Uh, my first point, uh, well, only Ukrainian can tell whether those Russians are good enough. Don't judge by yourself. But okay, if you have a problem, I suggest you a substitution. Tell we need to do everything to destroy the imperial Russia. Those, 
those Russians who want to reestablish the Soviet Empire and the Russian Empire. They do not want uh, democracy. They want to expand. We need to destroy this imperial, imperialistic uh, Russia. It would fall a bit easier uh, to you. And maybe 100 years after that, when Russia uh, is democracy, I don't believe it. Uh, but still, you need to have this kind of hope. Uh, but maybe then uh, you, uh, you would uh, be, uh, be free uh, to start uh, talking about uh, friendly uh, relations, uh, um, but only with a democratic Russia and not imperialistic Russia as of today. Thank you very much. I think we are at the end of our discussion today. We're also a little al already a little bit over time. I understand that uh, our guests probably uh, might have uh, other uh, appointments. Thank you very much for this discussion. Um, I appreciate your openness. I appreciate your frankness. And uh, well, I hope uh, if somebody was taking notes of your promises. Uh, so yes, thank you very much. We will. We will. So next time, next year, during the next annual conference. Uh, also, thank you, thank you very much, um, Solomia Bobrovska. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your statements. <laughs> and thank you to our guests. Thank you for being here for discussing with us. And I think Stefanie Schiffa would love to say final words. Uh, uh, thank you, Anna, for this interesting panel. Thank you to all panelists. This was a very good conclusion to our thesis, no democracy without security, and no local democracy without resilience and security for Ukraine. So thank you very much for finalizing that. Uh, I can promise you the Kiev Dialogue will continue working, thinking about local democracy and everything what is needed to promote it in Ukraine and to continue working and supporting our partners and friends in Ukraine. So thank you very much to everybody. And uh, we are now all invited to have a continuation at the restaurant where we have already been. There is a reception and please come there. Our Ukrainian friends and partners will continue tomorrow, already without the other ones, in, a, in, a, in another uh, several visits to, to German uh, partners here in Berlin. But this is a same, separate part of our program. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much to the wonderful translators for your improv um, improvising. <laughs> and um, to the... And to the whole team of um, Kiev Dialogue, thank you. Sorry, could you please give me 30 seconds? Because I want to invite you this evening, here in this room, here on the stage, to the presentation of a Ukrainian very uh, unusual project. It's about Mariupol, it's about the cultural heritage, preservation of cultural heritage. I will invite you not only to the reality here, but also to some kind of digital world, even a metaverse museum, and we will have a relaxed talk about it. And I hope that I roused a bit your interest. And if yes, then we have an appointment here at half past seven. I will be glad to see you here.